everyone. My name is David Morgan. I'm Arlington's environmental climate and conservation agent. The March 7th, 2024 public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be put, uh, conducted in a remote format consistent with chapter two of the acts of 2023, which extended remote par participation in public meetings till March 31st, 2025. Please note that the meeting is being recorded. All meeting materials can be found at the link that I'm putting in the chat right now. Chuck Taroni is our commission chair. He'll facilitate tonight's meeting and please note that there'll be a public comment period for each hearing. Each vote taken during this meeting will be conducted via mm -hmm. local vote and we begin with roll call attendance. So Chuck to you for attendance and agenda review. Sure, uh, I'll start with the attendance. And um, so could I just get everyone to let us know that you're here and that start with Mike Gildas game. I'm here. And Nathaniel Stevens. Present. Susan Chapnick. Here. David White. Here. David Kaplan. Here. And I'm gonna say Brian McBride, but I heard he's not here. Is that confirmed? Brian McBride is hearing nothing. I'll move on to, uh, I know that, Sarah Alfranco uh, is not going to be here tonight. She let me know that. Helene Coleman, are you here? I'm here. Okay, so those are two associates member. And Chuck Taroni, chair, is here. So for our agenda tonight, on March 7th, we'll start off with reviewing the minutes. We'll have a discussion at 66, the 66R Dudley Street, Waters Body Working Group a discussion artificial turf um, mm -hmm. update and our hearings will be 51 Grove Street, 51 Birch Street, 2 Reservoir. And then I'm going to take um, notice of intent for Thorndike Place and then 88 Coolidge and 459 Mystic Street. So that's the agenda. I want to let anyone know that came for 88 Coolidge tonight that that has been continued to our March 21st meeting. And with that, we're going to start in on reviewing the minutes. Chuck, can I just interject? So 88 Coolidge will still have a vote to continue it, right? But it was requested to continue by the... Absolutely. Okay. This okay, is thanks. not... This mm -hmm. part of the hearing, I was just reviewing the agenda. Thank you. Okay. So, David, do you have the minutes? Yes, I received edits from Nathaniel Stevens. Let me share my screen. I haven't had a chance to review these myself. Brian Klopp, our conservation administrator, did these minutes. And Nathaniel contributed, as I said. So we'll review them together. Brian, do you want to walk us through the document since I'm not familiar with it? Uh, yes, I mean, the way I've been, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, reviewing the minutes is just kind of scrolling through and kind of slowly. And then if any commissioners had any questions about anything, uh, you know, we could stop and discuss. All right, looks like Nathaniel had clarification to the inland mm -hmm. zoning district discussion. Clarifying language around uses of the pile expense account. Bit of wordsmithing right the road here. Clarifications on the Thorndike Place discussion. More 
time. Like you adjourned that meeting at 10 15. Any comments or questions, clarifications? Motion to approve as amended. Second. So I have real cold vote, Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, moving right along. We have uh, a discussion concerning 66 and 66R Dudley Street. Ryan, this is uh, something that you were working on. Can you bring us the commission up to date on that? Uh, yes, let me just pull up the email that I'm looking for here. Um, all right, so at our last meeting, we had um, amended the enforcement order uh, requiring the uh, owners at 66 to 66 R Dudley Street uh, to coordinate with the uh, condominium association at the Millbrook uh, condominiums uh, by tonight's meeting on 3-7. Uh, I did receive email confirmation and a summary of their site visit. They had a site visit uh, on Thursday, February 29th with four residents from Millbrook Condominium Association um, so during that meeting, they discussed the need and they will be getting a survey to determine the exact property lines. Um, and the Millbrook condominium association did give permission, uh, to the owners at 66 to 66 R Dudley street, uh, permission to work on their property in order to bring it back into compliance as there was that small triangle of land that, uh, was, altered that was on the Millbrook condominium property. Uh, so as they understand it, they will be, there will be need to remove some layers of cobblestone, uh, a grill that was stored out there and then planting of native plants. Um, so we don't have too many details that were provided from that update. Um, just that they will be getting a survey and that they have a general idea. I would like to see maybe something with, um, you know, even if it's just a couple of bullet points with some dates in order for uh, compliance, you know, for when they plan to have the 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 rubble removed, when they plan to have the native plantings installed. Uh, I would like to see something like that. And I anticipate the commission would feel similarly. Um, and perhaps we could have them attend a uh, future meeting, if not this, me if not the uh, next meeting one in the near future. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so it looks like there's so why this is on the agenda tonight because this is the date that they were supposed to report back to the Conservation Commission with some follow ups. So uh, Ryan's, I guess what we're doing here is we might be uh, updating the enforcement order with some dates, cleanup, and planting. But I'm wondering if the commission would entertain. Uh, putting planting on the enforcement order without seeing a planting plan. So with that, I'll just look, and I see that Nathaniel Stevens' hand is up. So Nathaniel. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for that report. Um, I agree with Ryan that we should put some uh, some deadlines in when we amend the enforcement order. I'm trying to remember, Chuck was on the site visit with me, and maybe David, that I thought the property owner did commit to a date to do the plantings. I thought we discussed that with him, and I want June 15th is popping in my in my head, but I don't know if that's the right mm -hmm. date. And I don't know, uh, you have my, I wrote up notes from that site visit. Hopefully those are in the file, but I think that might have a date in it. Okay. Any other comments on this enforcement uh, update? And then Chuck, we're going to need oh, to. Sorry, I didn't put my hand up. <laughs> Can I make one comment? Sure. Okay. Um, 
I would be careful about being too specific in the enforcement order about the things that need to be removed. Dates for planting, I'm fine with. The reason I say that is because there's other things besides just the grill and the gravel. There was artificial turf. There were there were other things in that corner that when they do the survey is likely going to be part of the condo association. So I don't want to be so specific in there. Um, I just want to be careful about that. All right. So yeah, not seeing other hands. Um, so it seems like we need some specific language here. I don't know if we can put something together tonight or if um, we, we send that to have David and Ryan work on that and with with Nathaniel's notes, come up with the date. And I would definitely have a initial site visit to talk about what Susan brought up about what you should and should not remove in that area. Um, I don't know if that's something that people want to approve or do you want to see uh, an amended enforcement order with all this information on it before we vote? Uh, David Kaplan has his hand up. What, are we discussing what to remove just within the encroachment or for the entire um, unpermitted work in the resource area? So my understanding is that we were trying to establish a buffer strip and remove items in that area. So um, topsoil and mulch could go down and plantings could be established. And this is yeah, right I was just, just basically top trying, to, bank. trying to think about how to articulate that. And if we could, you know, just restore, um, you know, restore the encroachment or, you know, whatever the area we're talking about. Um, so I'm just just thinking out loud how we can phrase it in a way that allows for them to move forward with the planting and the removal of all you know any and all debris that's that's found in that area. The problem is there's a lot of encroachment and unpermitted work, and there's no way we're going to get restoration that mat that matches what was done because they're using it as a parking lot, um, and and storing trucks there. So I think you're right, David. We do want them to keep marching forward. Um, but I'm not sure if we have all the information tonight to write everything down because Let's I don't have Nathaniel's notes in front of me either, but sure. I see David has something he wants to say. Yeah. Let's let David Morgan, uh, chime in. I have a question, which Susan just partially addressed. The initial work, as I remember that. I guess first started the encroachment <clears throat> was many years back. It was clearing of shrubs and possibly trees and other plant material and then filling with the uh, gravel and, and so forth. So, and, and most of that was on condo association land. So I guess we don't have an answer yet. Uh, this is, Partly my question, do we have an answer from the condo association about what that land will be used for in the future? Are they granting the owners of 66, 66R Dudley permission to continue using that land? And are they going to allow it to stay in the state that it's in? Or are they saying you're no longer allowed to use this part of our property and in order mm. to get into compliance? We have to do what the commission says, so you need to follow. What the sure, let's just get Ryan in on that because I didn't hear him say exactly what you re just repeated. Yeah, so I don't see anywhere in what they've sent me that would say that they could continue to use that parcel of land. Um, what I'm what I'm reading is, you know, verbatim. In terms of the restoration, it was decided that Sal would conduct the work, including the work required on Millbrook's triangle portion of land, to bring the entire area into compliance with the Conservation Commission's request. Um, so that doesn't tell me that they're, you know, granting any sort of like permanent easement on that land or anything like that. Uh, it would just be for mm. bringing it into compliance. Yeah. All right. So, you know, it, it, it does seem a little bit difficult. I, uh, Nathaniel, uh, go ahead. I was just going to conclude nice. here, but. Yeah, I was going to say uh, it's helpful. I guess, I guess ultimately we don't, 
care what their arrangement is between the condo association and the uh, property owner, the owner of 66 and 66 R, other than the condo association agreeing for restoration work to be done on their property, which I'm hearing is being done. But I think our purview is we're not getting into that debate about whether the condo association is going to let them you know, park a truck on their on their land. I think our focus is Wetlands Protection Act, Wetlands Bylaw. We discussed with the property owner out on the site in December what he would do to restore and create a buffer. And I think we just proceed with that and he works out whatever permission he needs, formal permission or not from the condo association to do that work on, on their land. So I think we should try to not make it too complicated for us. <laughs> sure. Even that, I would that? like I would like to see if somebody wants to turn this into motion, if you agree, I would like to see a planting plan for um, establishing a buffer strip on 6666R and the part of land that they are using, that is the condo association's land, by removing all, um, removing the, the, I don't know what you want to call it, man-made structures or, or not natural um, objects or structures and putting in some plantings in this buffer strip um, to protect the upper bank of Millbrook as an part of the as the enforcement order and make this they have to go in by you know June 15th, June 1st, whatever date. They have to give us a plan and then give us a plan by a certain date and then they have to go in by a certain date. That's what I would like to see. I agree about the necessity of a plan. I'm concerned about the terminology that we present to them saying buffer strip. I think they've done a lot more work in over many more years than a buffer strip would sufficiently replace. And I feel like we had an initial conversation with the owner at 66 Dudley, mainly Chuck, <laughs> and he working out what he would find amenable. I don't know that this group has had a chance to get their heads around what work has been done and what we find. All right. Good. So I'd like to move this along. It doesn't sound like we have a resolution. Maybe they can, we could just update the enforcement order to come to a meeting. Let's say if they're here in town, if that's the case, in a month. Uh, and that they are going to provide a planting plan and discuss next steps with the Conservation Commission. And maybe that's well, as far as we can get. Also, move, I will make a motion to amend the enforcement order to that effect. Second. Okay. Great. Uh, Mike Gildeskin? Yes. Susan Chapnick? Yes. David White? Yes. David Kaplan? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Moving right along, we have the Water Bodies Working Group, uh, and we're going to review the budget and that can be put on the screen right now and i'm not sure if david white or it's david white this is his i'll do it his group thanks david so we talked about the budget for next fiscal year and realized that we need more so, money to do things so properly. david maybe somebody should put the budget up yes Would that be helpful okay <laughs> And it's going to happen. We'll get there. Yeah, you can go ahead, David. I'll pull it up. Yep. So the Water Bodies Working Group has realized that we are not really doing a full job in some areas we need responsibility for. 
Um, so the budget for next fiscal year is $120,000, more than twice what it was for the last fiscal year. Some of that is related to work on Spy Pond, but a big piece of that is increase in the reservoir budget to properly harvest the water chestnuts. We did a partial job for years, which basically doesn't improve things, just keeps on perpetuating the problem. So that's why you increase the reservoir budget to um, try to do four weeks of harvesting work rather than two. And also Hills Pond, 6,000 for next fiscal year and possible expenses for McLennan and other things as well. That brings a total of $120,000 request. We'll bring this to the Finance Committee in, a, in about a week and a half. Any questions? Uh, if you, so I can't see who has their hand raised, so if you could just talk, <laughs> maybe that'll work. It's not, I only see David, so maybe no hands are raised. Uh, Chuck, it's Mike here. I'll oh, okay, Mike. have a quick question. Um, is this, this is funds, this additional funds would be coming from uh, town meeting or? Town meeting, yes. Yeah, okay. And so that, would that enable us, uh, if it's voted on town meeting in April, uh, that'll give us adequate time to uh, pull together contracts and so forth? There's, a, there's an overlap of contracts. We're trying to do some contracts this year with the money we have available now. And some contracts will extend into next year. So it's a, it's a complicated thing. We sort of straddle the fiscal year with the contracts. So I think we have worked out that we can do things adequately. But it's always a sort of balancing act to uh, keep things in line. Right, if I could just um, elaborate just a tiny bit. Um, the fiscal year and the contract years are not are mismatched. So the fiscal year, as you know, starts in July and the contract years start in January. So for this fiscal year, we're, we're currently working on contracts with SWCA to do the aquatic management that we need to do in May for Spy Pond and with a, a contractor for the res water chestnuts. We do have um, budget for that. Um, though we're going over budget, we have funds that were encumbered for that. So we're okay for this fiscal year ending in June. Um, we will need to do new contracts next year and maybe make a decision whether we want to change our contract time to match the fiscal year or not, or, you know, but that, that would be a later discussion. Thanks. Yeah. I think part of the design is because uh, because the fiscal year falls in the middle of sort of the the, uh, the year the period of time when the work is going to be done i think it's where we've been trying to structure it so we not we're not stuck on the fiscal year that is we're not prevented from doing weed harvesting before the new fiscal year begins if that's if that's needed so I thought Correct. that it had been mm -hmm. set up so it revolves a little bit. Right. And it is a revolving fund. We don't we don't lose yeah. this money. This right. money is earmarked for water bodies. It doesn't go back into the capital fund to be used for other things. Yeah, you're right, Nathaniel. We try to maintain a balance so we can manage those things. Right. I'll make a motion to David, what do you want to approve the this request? Yes. Requested budget. Yes. So that we can present it to FinCom. Yep. Second. So we have a uh, we have a second motion and Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Moving I also right like up. to mention that we have a report from twenty three that we like people to look at a lot of details in the report. I think we already approved that, David. I'm just mentioning it to people to look, look at it again. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. We already approved it, but I'm just right. telling people that it's there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we won't have a tree committee update tonight. So I'm going to move right on to Mike Gildas' game for a turf, uh, artificial turf study committee update. 
with the next meeting being on, uh, I hope this is correct, 3-12-2024. Mike? Tuesday, that's correct, John. Uh, very briefly, uh, the committee has been meeting essentially weekly uh, since we were empowered to meet, and we are at the point now where we're putting together uh, reports and recommendations. Uh, we are planning to submit the report if it's all going according to plan uh, by uh, about the third week in March so that we can uh, get it to the town uh, for their uh, in, in time for town meeting. So that's where we're at at the moment. And well, it's a tight schedule, but uh, we, we think we can accomplish it. Yeah, Mike, you, you guys have been meeting not only every every time you schedule a meeting, which seems like once a week, but uh, with outside of that, too, to get these reports together. So it's been quite a commitment. We really appreciate it. I'm sure the town, when this report is finished, will appreciate that, all that work also. Uh, Susan. Just one brief question, Mike, because I missed some of the meetings. Will there be opportunity for the public to comment on a public draft prior to the report going um, to town meeting as requested by the Warren article? There will be, and uh, as my understanding, there will be, and uh, most of the documents that have been de developed so far have already been part of the minutes uh, and submitted uh, comments uh, that have gone to the turf study committee. So the public uh, ha hasn't seen the full report and I haven't seen the full report yet, but uh, I, I know that it will be out there. Thank you. <clears throat> Stay tuned. Chuck, you're muted. Okay. Seeing no more hands, uh, I'm going to move on to the hearing section of uh, our agenda. And the first thing on our agenda is 51 Grove Street. And for those that don't know that, that's where the DPW, uh, the DPW is for the town of Arlington. And Haley Page, I suspect, is here, and she's going to start sharing a screen. But I'm going to just intro this. Uh, the culvert inspection was performed that led to the conclusion that portions of the existing culvert are in poor to fair conditions. The DPW is proposing to rehabilitate a section of the culvert which, uh, with structural lining system which will minimize impacts to the adjacent resource area. And with that, uh, Haley, could you uh, just introduce yourself for the record and uh, start uh, updating the commission on this project? Sure thing, can everyone hear me? I had trouble with my microphone a little bit, so I just wanna make sure. Sure, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, hello, my name is Haley Page. I am the environmental scientist with Weston and Samson work to pull together this permit application. I'm joined today with the project landscape architect, David Steves, and also the project engineer, Elena Compter. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna jump in with that presentation that we held off on presenting last meeting. Um, let me know once you can all see my screen. Okay. Great, so, um, Let's jump right in. So as mentioned, um, this project is located at 51 Grove Street, which is the um, DPW site. Um, you'll see I have on this locust map outlined in purple, that is the entire DPW site footprint. And in red is our proposed area for the culvert uh, repair project. Um, this is just an aerial image to make sure everyone is oriented to where we're looking at. Um, it is currently under construction for the DPW facility repairs project. Um, and just wanting to make sure to give everyone an updated timeline and what's been going on with this project. So um, originally a notice of intent was submitted for the um, DPW facility improvements project. Um, this order of conditions was extended through December of 2026. On February 15th, 2024, 
Um, Weston and Sampson came and presented to the commission to request an amendment for this uh, culvert repair project. However, it was deemed that a notice of intent was required. Therefore, we followed up on February 21st with this notice of intent application. So to give a little bit of background on this culvert, um, you will see uh, that starting, um, we are starting at the end, which is located closest to Grove Street. So the images on this side of my screen are representing the area where the culvert enters the site and then begins to run under buildings within the DPW facility. Um, then the portion of the culvert becomes daylit, as you can see in this image on the left here, um, where the culvert exits the building, what's referred to on the plans as building B here. This is where we would begin our culvert um, repairs project and it would extend to just before where the culvert daylights again, um, adjacent to the high school. And this is an image of that view. So continuing as mentioned in 2020, a culvert assessment was performed um, and it was deemed that this portion of the culvert where we are proposing the repairs, that it was in a poor condition. So this is an image looking at one portion of this culvert running underground. And I have another image also. You can see that there is some cracking in um, the concrete taking place and there is some erosion and rusting. Um, so that is the main reason why um, it was looked into for whether replacement repairs or what was the best method to deal with this portion of the culvert. So the proposed project um, is to look to utilize a glass reinforced plastic liner to be installed approximately 204 linear feet within the footprint of the existing culvert. This culvert liner will be 1.26 inches thick and will provide up to a 100 year life expectancy. Um, the GRP liner segments will be custom made to fit the shape of the culvert, um, which includes the daylit portions will be remain daylit um, and the uh, completely the completely culverted portions running underground will remain that way as well. Um, this will overall um, increase the carrying capacity from the existing condi conditions and improve um, hydraulic conditions. So this is a image showing on the left, this is the existing culvert. And on the right, this is an image of what this sort of proposed liner looks after it is completed being installed. So I just wanted to pull in um, a plan sheet. I know we kind of went through this previously in the last meeting, um, but I just wanted to point out again with color, I will zoom in on this in a little bit I, if any questions come up. Um, but this is just to give a better understanding of that building that I was pointing to in those images referred to as building B on those plans. So you'll see that the culvert portion that we have in color down here, this is the limits of the culvert liner where we're looking to install. I also wanted to include the details of this culvert liner to show in the cross sections of the closed culvert liner on the left here and a cross section of the open culvert liner on the right here. So uh, the culvert liner will be installed via the existing daylit section in the center of the site. Um, the segments will be lowered into that culvert and transported along the length of the culvert to the required location, which on the next few slides, I'm gonna speak through a little bit more on the exact location. Um, each segment will connect to the previously installed segment by a socket and spigot joint. And once the liner is in place, the gap between the existing culvert and the culvert liner will be filled with free flowing high strength grout. So as I mentioned to touch base on the installation sequence. Um, so for reference, this is building B and these are not to scale by any means. Um, so the culvert liners will be dropped in in the daylight region, which is region F here. And then they will be pulled back upstream and installed coming back down towards region F. Continuing, the next portions will be dropped into region F and it will be installed beginning at region D or region G and working back upstream towards that daylight section. 
So the last section that will be installed will be the daylit section. Now just jumping into the environmental considerations. Um, so for this project, we are proposing 408 linear feet of bank impacts, um, 1,300 square feet of land underwater impacts, and 82 square feet of bordering land subject to flooding. There will be no additional impacts within the riverfront area other than those that were previously um, approved in the existing DPW facility improvements project. And also there will be no additional impact into any Arlington local buffer zones, including the 25 foot, 50 foot and 100 foot buffer zone off of the top of bank. So I also wanted to touch base on some of the methods of bypassing the water during construction. So a water bypass will be set up at the inlet, which is shown as region A on this image and using Godwin ramp, um, they will be set up to allow vehicles to still be able to pass over while still bypassing the water downstream, which will be down just past region G to where the portion of the culvert daylights near the high school. This section of the culvert is existing concrete, so we do not expect any drastic scouring impact um, due to the entire culvert being consistent of um, concrete. Um, so that's kind of that. And then we're going to open it up to questions now. If the commissioners have any questions, we appreciate your time and listening on our project. Um, and we'd be happy to answer anything you may have at this time. Uh, sure. Does uh, any of the conservation commissioners have uh, questions about this uh, project? Yes. Um, Mike Gildas game. Yeah, I, I am assuming that the insert, the flowing in of the grout will tend to repair some of the damaged or deteriorating concrete that uh, you showed pictures of. I don't know how long that uh, concrete's been in place, but it's probably 100 years or something. But uh, the uh, so the effect of the grouting will be to stabilize and repair any of the damaged concrete. Is that correct? I believe, and Elena and Dave, feel free to chime in. I believe that the point of this grout is to fill in the gaps in between the existing culvert and the culvert liner to make sure that culvert liner is secured in place. Yeah, right. I can I can jump in. Yeah, that's exactly right, Mike. Um, the, the grouting fills the annular space between the new liner, which acts as a form and does exactly that. It reinforces structurally all the existing crumbling conditions, in the existing culvert. So that's a side benefit to also uh, streamlining the uh, flow by adding this culvert uh, liner insert. Thank you. Uh, David Chap, uh, I, I didn't see who raised their hand first, so I'm just gonna call on David Kaplan. Thanks. Um, I'll be quick. Um, what's the substrate of the daylit sections of that stream? Is that a uh, concrete yes. base? Yes, it's Thank a bunch you. of crushed concrete, mainly making up the entire culvert um, ground. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Susan Chapnick. Thank you. Um, so I do understand that this is a culvert. Um, but it is, there are jurisdictional areas that are getting impacted as you listed in the table. Are there any mitigation measures that you're planning to offset those impacts? So we don't have any mitigation um, proposed. The bank is not creating any necessary great habitat being that it is you know, existing of concrete liner. And also we don't expect to see um, the flood storage to be any lesser than what is currently existing with this proposed liner. Um, so I guess the answer would be no. And we did propose this project as a limited project under the Wetlands Protection Act 10.53i as a maintenance project. So we are not proposing mitigation for this portion of the project. However, through the overall DPW facility improvement project, there is a fair share of um, plantings being implemented within the riverfront area that overall will increase, you know, shading and habitat on site. 
Thank you for that explanation. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from commission members? So I had a I had one qu question. Um, so you're um, I know you're lining this, and does is the lining um, a complete circle? And is there how do you how do you um, so at the, at the beginning where it enters, all right, at some point, there's going to have to be some sort of lip. And I was wondering that we weren't shown how that happens, or does the liner only three-sided all the way through? And my second question would be, when you find some damage that uh, needs to be repaired prior to the liner going in, do you have to uh, cut through the top to re make that repair? I can, I'm just going to pull up, I'm trying to pull back up the image. So it would be completely four-sided in those closed culvert sections. Um, I mean, I, I, I believe that it would just be installed in the exact, because without the grout around it, the space of the culvert liner is smaller. So it should be able to drop, be dropped right in and dragged to the appropriate place. As for how it lines up, I believe I pulled in a spec into this presentation, which Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, if this is not the right image, but I believe this is kind of showing a bit better how the systems would connect to one, one another. Um, and I believe it's using a joint sealer and there's a gasket in place that would seal them together. Um, I guess that's my best go. I'm not an engineer. Yeah. Yeah. No, that um, wasn't. <laughs> That's a good answer, but uh, I was I was asking uh, the first uh, the the first line air piece um, is that uh, is that flush with the I guess the bottom of the culvert where it exists now, or is it going to have that inch and a half of grout that it has to uh, rise up and but, uh, go over? Yeah, I I I know what you're asking, Chuck, and and yeah, we had the same question, which is these liner sections, and they're obviously smaller than the full culvert surround. They're held in to held in place by these wedges or or wood uh, block spacers, so it's very secured and held in place. And then it's the grout is then pumped into the annular space, which fills all the damaged and cracked and small. Uh, surfaces of the existing culvert. And then the transition that you're asking about where the water, uh, the existing culvert meets this head wall, that's uh, um, cast in place and, and faded into the existing culvert liner. So it's a, it's a poured and uh, formed uh, transition of uh, concrete into the, from the existing to the new. And it will encompass uh, several inches of existing um, transition from to the to the new edge of liner. Does does that adequately kind of describe how they're planning to transition that? And yeah, it sounds like there is that was um, taken into consideration, and it's yeah. just not going to be a, a a wall that would start collecting anything that's. Uh, oh, right. kind of coming down the stream like sticks and and whatnot because there's a lip right there right. okay yep. um not seeing any other commissioners with uh, their hand raised i'm gonna go and ask if anyone attending tonight's meeting has any uh has any questions about uh, 51 grove street if you could just raise your hand it's in the reactions button raise hand function, you'll go to the top of the screen and we'll be able to see you. And David, I see none. Do you see, see anyone? Seems like, yep. Okay, so no, uh, no, uh, one uh, that's watching tonight would want to ask any questions. Uh, so back to the commission for further comments or a motion. And David Kaplan. Yeah, just um, what time of year are you anticipating the work? 
so the contractor is planning to start this work uh, mid-July. So it's actually going to be at, be at a low flow, anticipated low flow time of, this, of the year. So. Okay. And um, I assume work won't be scheduled during storms it'll be paused or you i mean do you and i assume you anticipate most of the if not all of the water to be um routed through those bypass or is that just for the base flow um yes the forecast will be monitored as the walk work progresses um and the uh any uh, stop log or any damming of the water can be opened during a, a large storm event but during the work, uh, while it's being performed, it will be bypassed. But um, it will be um, the the length of building will be about five feet, four and a half feet, hopefully. Um, so it's sorry, you, you you faded out a little bit on the time frame or out how long it was going to take. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, it's going to take a minimum of four to four and a half weeks um, thereabouts. Um, so the weather is going to be closely monitored as the work progresses and uh, uh, coordinated with the town. Right. And it doesn't sound like the work you're proposing, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of opportunity, you know, if there is a big rainstorm to you know, flush anything in the workspace downstream. It sounds like it would be pretty stable. Can you comment on that? Yes. As they place the uh, liner sections, and they vary in size, but they're between four and eight feet in length. So they're, they're winched into place actually on a rail system, and they're pulled in from the far end to the head wall that we were talking about just a, a moment ago. And then they're wedged in place, so very, very secure. So they're held firmly in place until they're grouted, so the, the stream can be managed and opened um, as necessary to accommodate uh, a, a large storm event if that were to happen. Um, okay, thank you for that. Then sure. Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, I was wondering if you considered any alternatives uh, to this project that might result in fewer impacts, alteration of resource areas? And if so, what those were? I know a few alternatives were considered um, way back when, when this project started, it was looking at replacing the culvert, which was going to lead to greater impacts and also partial replacement and repairs, um, which still at the end of the day, the portion of, you know, replacement is going to cause more impacts than repair repairs. Um, and then this was deemed the best alternative um, to just install this culvert liner was the least um, impactful um, alternative that was come up with. I believe those are the three alternatives that were looked at other than doing nothing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Chapnick. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, you had mentioned that this was being proposed as a limited project or maintenance, but it is an NOI. Yep. It's WP. Okay. So I yep. just want to make that clear for, for everybody. So yep, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. And I also um, just, just to David's Dave's point about time of year, um, which was established. I, if we do um, consider this project, I would like a special condition to condition time of year for for low flow events. We've done that before um, for other projects that have impacted um, waterways. For example, when Weeds Brook needed to be called, changed on. Um, Actually, it's also back in this area. That's the Myrak property. Um, we we had conditioned time of year um, for low flow. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that okay. shouldn't be a problem. Be, that that timeline was uh, given to us by the contractor. That's their uh, game mm -hmm. plan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know you're by bypassing um, Millbrook and. What I wasn't clear with it was, would you need to stop work if a storm, uh, you know, if there was a storm, so let's say in 24 hours, would you stop work, you know, that day? How would that be handled um, for storms, even though you're bypassing? 
my understanding is that if there were a storm that's coming and we'll, we'll be, you know, the contractor will be keeping an eye obviously on the forecast that would potentially overwhelm uh, the, the damming uh, and containment of the water. My understanding is that they would open it then stabilize the construction or remove anything that is not yet set or stabilized and uh, in anticipation of the storm and then resume uh, construction uh, after that threat passed. But they would allow water to pass through the existing culvert and any work in place that's secure and stable until the storm event were, were over. Sure, and do we have to worry about the grout? And and so, if the grout needed a day to set, should we set a uh, a condition that says no work can happen within 24 hours of a storm of a half inch or more? If the if the grout set it set in that, you know 15 minutes, I guess it wouldn't be needed. But so I'm not sure how long it takes the grout to set, and once it's in there, is it stable or is it, would it be flushed out? Uh, once the, once the liner is in place, all the water would be going through the liner before they set the grout, actually, Chuck, they, they, uh, fabricate that head wall, that transition okay. head wall. So, um, before they even grout it, that's in place. So water would be going through the culvert at that point, although not, um, um, yet grouted in place, but secured with the wood blocking, as I mentioned. I, I think that order would probably make sense. Our concern would be that would would be similar that they, I mean, they do this all the time. I'm sure this is not an uncommon they deal with water, but um, yeah, we would want to make sure that the the grouting is uh, not in any jeopardy or has time to fully cure and set um, before it's allowed to function in its normal way. So maybe an order that would be. Um, just take precautions as uh, the manufacturer recommends for the full curing of uh, the grouting. Okay. I don't know that number, but... Um... <laughs> okay. Uh, Chuck, so... can I just sure. add on to that? It might, it might have been helpful for us to have um, their, this in writing from the applicant, what happens when um, installation construction begins and a, lar a large storm event happens. And to have that in writing, this is the plan of what to do. Um, I think I rather than us writing a, a special condition that's like iffy. Just wanna make a note that Brian McBride just uh, chimed into the meeting. He's uh, attending the meeting at this moment, Commissioner Brian McBride. Okay. Um, I think, I think, I think that, that we could... That could make sense. Maybe it's like a, a storm ma maintenance plan or storm management plan to be put in place. And that's definitely something that can be submitted to the commission prior to commencement of construction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? I'll make and, a motion to close yep. the hearing. I have a second. I'll second. Um, Mike Gildas game. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Um, conditions I have is start in July. And before work starts, we will be able to review and approve a storm management plan. Any, any other conditions? That could also be the administrator could approve that plan also, and it wouldn't have to come back to the Conservation Commission. That would be acceptable to me. Okay, I accept yeah, that well, amendment. Chuck, I would just say start uh, construction start after July 1st of any year, because in case, God forbid, this gets delayed a year, we have to do it next year. It has to be done next year. Then it just, we, we um, get around the spawning season for the alewife. So if that's. 
It's acceptable. Yeah. So I wasn't making a motion, but uh, if someone wants to make a motion with those two conditions. Yeah. Uh, about Ryan. Ryan has his hand up. Oh, yeah. Ryan. I just wanted to chime in because Chuck, uh, I just wanted to make a clarification on language. You said the administrator for uh, approving the plan. Uh, do you mean me or do you mean David or either one? I meant either one. Fair enough. But I, how about I say staff? How about I go. say, since we have two now, I can say staff. So <laughs> uh, staff approves the stormwater management plan prior I to. I think it's storm management. Storm management. Yeah. Storm not, management it's not stormwater, it's yeah. Yeah, storms. Yeah. Thank you. Staff approves the storm management plan. And David White. I just want to note that there's no alewives this section of Millbrook. They can't get past Cook's Hollow Dam. No, I'm just thinking downstream, if there's any downstream impacts, is my concern. So thanks. Yeah, David, I, I realize that they're probably not up. any of the fish that spawn. So. Okay. So I'll any more? Motion. Sure. Thank you. Sorry. I'll make a motion to issue the order of conditions for this limited project under both the act and the bylaw with the conditions that Chuck just recited. I'll second. Sure. Mike Gilda's and, game. Oh, wait. Then mm. you have discussion, and I just want to mention, as we all know, we have other standard conditions for work, um, you know, construction, debris, things not falling into the pond, you know, erosion controls, et cetera. So, so we have a, a bunch of other standard conditions that will apply that we didn't specifically discuss that are kind of normal operating standard conditions we add to projects right I these, these are was... our special special conditions that we just... special they're, they're special 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 because, <laughs> because we special, have a lot of special, special conditions i super then... hate to belabor this but okay. i thought those conditions those special conditions are on the website attached to the download for this are they? and okay, so therefore great. didn't need to be discussed i didn't realize that thank you chuck mm -hmm. so okay i'm let's go i don't don't even know where we are so uh my build this game <laughs> yes David White. David White. Yes. Uh, my, uh, David Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And that will be prepared sometime in the next couple of weeks. And if you need to understand that better, call uh, the office and talk to David or Ryan. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great night. All right. Thank, Haley. You, Thank Haley. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Sure. And moving right along, I want to start right in on um, it's 51 Birch Street. And uh, just start this off. 51. Here we go. Uh, the public uh, here we can consider the notice of intent to demolish a single family house dwelling and construct a two family dwelling associated pertinences on 51 Birch Street within the borderland subject to flooding. We left this at our last meeting with some questions from the engineering department. I'm going to turn quickly to David Morgan for an update on that memo. I do know that we heard from um, engineering mm -hmm. details on that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but they also received the stormwater permit for this project. Yeah, and I see Rich nodding his head. So um, I believe both of those things happened. So those are those two last items that needed to be fulfilled have been fulfilled. Okay, so that's where we are. Now, I'm not sure the commission, we can bring on the applicant or I can entertain comments and motions at this moment. And maybe I should go to any of butters first, but maybe that's what Nathaniel's going to say. Sorry, I was just going to ask. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was just going to ask. I didn't hear David Morgan. What did engineering say? They signed off on this, essentially. Or something like that. Sorry, I haven't reviewed engineering's comments, but I believe. Yeah, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, but if yeah, you they could screen did... share it. That'd be great. I don't yes. see them on the website. Thanks. Uh, let me just grab it. I don't have it directly handy. I was going to ask the same thing. What were the comments and how were they resolved? I, I think. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, 
honestly, I thought that David was telling me that everything has been resolved. So I apologize for that. Well, maybe um, Rich can help us too, or, or yeah, let's get Rich in here. And, and yeah. uh, Rich, are uh, you uh, the, the real David? person you want to talk sure. to is Novak. He's the project. Yeah. <laughs> He's the one that's yeah. responding with the town engineer, so he can sort yeah. of over how we got to where we are today. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I may, Mike Novak from Patriot Engineering. Um, Thank you. I, I did receive the email from the town engineer. Um, I don't know if you, uh, I'll let David pull it up, but my understanding was, was there was like four, I think three or four uh, comments that I, as I read them, he said has been addressed. He also issued a, a plan in that email that is stamped approved through engineering. Um, I could quickly run through those quick, those small changes if you'd like, but it, it, it's at your discretion. I would like yeah. to hear them if you if you can be quick. Yeah, I... sure. If I, if you just bear with me a second, I'm going to pull it up in front of me so I don't uh, do it by memory. Um, and I, I, it's up to you if you want me to share this or not. Um, but uh, the there was let's see this. It would Five probably make, make sense, Mike, for you to share it if you can. If you sure. Can yep. tour. Let's see if I have the ability. There we go. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So that you can see that this was from the uh, Department of Public Works. So we received this on the 5th. Um, 51 Birch Major Stormwater Management. And we have approved up at the top and the I'll just quickly summarize the the comments. The approval of the design package does not defer discharge or release the owner's responsibility to construct the stormwater management system as designed. I think that sounds like a standard um, condition. The second one was the proposed porous driveway detail notes the minimum of 3.4 feet of depth of double wash stone shall be installed in all places of the driveway. Note that a minimum of two feet of depth between the bottom of the stone and the estimated seasonal high groundwater is required. And we've definitely discussed that at past meetings. Um, should site excavation indicate the groundwater table is higher than indicated by test pits, the design engineer will contact uh, engineering division to determine if any system changes are required. No problem there. Uh, on our end, uh, the following inspections shall be coordinated with the engineering division. They would like to see the bottom of excavation and system installation prior to backfill. Again, I see no issue with, with that. Uh, four was subsequent to required inspections. The following shall be submitted to the engineering division. Uh, storm, stormwater management certificate of compli completion uh, for the major permit, including as-built site plan stamped and signed by professional engineer. Statement of compliance stamped and signed and dated by design engineer stating stormwater management system in impervious area were constructed in accordance with the approved design package. Um, please note that the inspection services department will require receipt of the certificate of compliance prior to certificate of occupancy. So that uh, is again, not a problem on our end. And then the approval for the installation of the on-site stormwater management systems only. Uh, I think this is just a catch-all of additional permitting, including this board, this commission, of course, will require for any utility work proposed to take place within the town right away um, and to obtain compliance with the town's conservation commission. You say right there. Um, and they go on to say that you could require uh, changes and additions to the permit if needed. Um, that's a very quick summary to keep you keep you on, on time. Uh, I'll stop share and answer any questions. Sure. Any questions from the commissioners? No, thank you. Thank you for that summary. I guess if we, I'm just thinking ahead to make a note of it. If we do approve the project, I would suggest that we say that prior to applying for a certificate of compliance, they get their stormwater certificate of compliance and submit that to the commission first. Uh, and secondly, I think there were some materials that uh, needed to be submitted to engineering, and maybe we just say that some of those are also copied to the Conservation Commission office for the file. Um, Nathaniel, just as a point of procedure, do you think it's appropriate to put a few of these requirements as our special conditions or just reference this letter? Or do you think that what you just said covers it? No, I was going to actually, that was the third point I was going to make. Yeah, I, I would say that we, well, we have a general condition that says you need to comply with all other permits. So it would be adopted by reference in that, but we could explicitly have a condition to say that we're adopting the same conditions. 
I think that would would cover us yeah. a little better just because they're very yeah. specific. Okay, sure. thank you. Okay, any other questions from the commission? I mean, any just note that we did receive an updated plan, right? With a with some a few details revised. I think that came in at the last meeting. Uh, oh, that, okay. that plan, Sorry, the yeah. Line, the meeting. Thanks. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so if I if I could remind the commission, Mr. Chair, we 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 had the plan and the revisions for conservation commission requested back to you, but we were lacking the the engineering review. So I think this was the last piece of the puzzle, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyone attending tonight's meeting uh, that would like to say uh, make a comment about Fifty One Birch Street, please use the raise hand uh, function and the reactions button. Seeing none, I'm back to the commission for further comments or motions. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. A second. I'll second. Michael's game seconds. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Chuck Tironi says yes. Okay. Uh, so that was to close the hearing. Any, you want to close and then issue, right? I think I have that right. Any discussion? I think we discussed some special conditions by adopting the conditions that are in the town engineer's letter that are applicable to conservation. Mm -hmm. um, that was one condition. I think Nathaniel had another condition about before a COC is issued that we get the um, stormwater what, what certificate. Did you say? Certificate, mm -hmm. right? And what, did you have another one, Nathaniel? I did. Now well, I'm forgetting what uh, it is. I think it was just to be copied. Anything, uh, some of the documents that would be need to be submitted to engineering. Yeah, would so also be submitted to the conservation uh, agent. The conservation okay. Yeah. Okay. Point of clarification, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, Nathaniel, can I just drill down on that a second? He asked the, in terms of the inspections and reports, that's that's what you're referring to. Correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that'll make a motion to approve the project for those conditions. Can I get a second? A second. second. Mike, uh, David White, got a second. So we're going to start with David Cap Kaplan. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And David White. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Same as before, reach out to David uh, or Ryan next week. And uh, if you wanted to find out when this is going to be issued. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks both. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move right on to reservoir. Um, the public hearing will consider a notice of intent to construct an addition off the rear of a single family house, renovate the front porch and construct uh, landscape and hardscape activities within the riverfront and bordering land subject to flooding associated with Millbrook and the 100 foot buffer zone to a bordering vegetated wetland. Uh, is this um, LEC again? Do we uh, Rich Kirby or is this Mike Novak? I see Mike Novak on my screen here. Hi, I'm Nicole Ferrara from from LEC. Sure. I'll be overviewing the presentation, and joining me is Rich Kirby, also from LEC. Uh, Holly Samuels, the landscape designer, should be on and the homeowners, Linnea and David Bergeron, and uh, David Mullen, who's the architect, should also be also be on. So here is our, um, our notice of intent application. We're filing an NOI to construct an addition, as well as some hardscape and landscaping features um, to a single family dwelling. I'm gonna scroll to the aerial to familiarize the commission with with the site. All right, so here you can see. 
Nicole, can I ask you, is there any way to do full screen with that or is oh, are we stuck with this view? Is that better? Can zoom in? Yeah, maybe zoom in. That would be fine. All right. So here's our site. Uh, it's in the northwestern part of town. The Minutemen bike path runs along the southern property boundary just off site and uh, consists of a single family dwelling in the northern portion over here. Um, it's accessed via a paved driveway off of Reservoir Road. There is a garage located in the backyard, as well as a concrete walkway leading to the back steps. And the house is generally surrounded by lawn and some landscaping. And there's a fringe of some forested scrub uplands uh, along the southern boundary line going into the to the bike path over here. So the main uh, wetland features associated with the site is Mill Brook, which occurs, I'll scroll to the USGS map. Mill Brook occurs just off site on the other side of the bike path and flows in a southeasterly direction off site and it's contained within a uh, concrete retaining wall type bank. Scroll back to the aerial. So we had our surveyors just locate that uh, retaining wall as the edge of bank. And then also on or off site, we have a uh, BVW associated with No Name Brook. And No Name Brook is called a brook on the Arlington GIS, um, but it's not located on the USGS map. And um, according to USGS stream stats, it does not have a stream center line. And um, based on our observations of the drainage like swale character of this wetland, um, we don't believe that the brook is perennial. So we flagged it as a as a BVW. And we do have some photos of the wetland in our report. Oh, here's the bank and Mill Brook over here. And then we have our BVW. It's kind of located just off the path. Uh, lastly, we have bordering land subject to flooding. And that's uh, located in the southern part of the property to elevation 154. Let's just get back to that. And it clips the corner of the garage and the back lawn. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich, who's gonna discuss the proposed activities. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, could you scroll to the site plan, please? Yes. Thanks. So the... Um... The site plan was prepared by Rover Survey, and we have existing conditions in black and proposed conditions in red. And the, the major part of the project is really a, a 418 square foot addition off the rear or southern uh, boundary of the house. Um, the entirety of the addition is within uh, lawn or landscape land or within the footprint of the concrete walkway, stairs, and entry that's off the back of the house. Additionally, they're proposing uh, some stairs and a landing and a retaining wall off the back right corner of the addition to get it, to get access down to the uh, to the lower level by where the driveway is. Now, while the addition is 418 square feet, uh, we really made a big effort to try and keep our, um, our our impervious area increase to less than 350 square feet. And we got it down to uh, an increase of 318 square feet. And that's in large part because a portion of the addition is already above um, or proposed within impervious area, roughly the top quarter or so, as you can see from the plan. And uh, the applicant's also propose proposing to shorten the driveway. Um, right now we have, let's see, where is it? <clears throat> I wrote all of this out and I wrote down too much information. Um, but basically we're reducing the driveway from 315 square feet to uh, 277 square feet. So that's how we come up with our net increase of 318, which is you know a fair amount under the, uh, the 350. 
So um, mitigation, we're proposing a few different things for mitigation. Obviously, we have erosion controls, and you can see the curved double line, which represents a 12-inch compost sock along the limit of work area. Uh, we're also proposing silt sacks in the two catch basins on North Street and at the intersection of North Street and Reservoir Road. Those, of course, will remain in place until construction is complete and all areas are stabilized by vegetation. And we're also are proposing some stormwater management, even though none's required under the Wetlands Protection Act or under the Arlington regulations because we're under 350. We are proposing a stone trench along the southern edge of the um, of the proposed addition and another one along the western and southern edge of the garage. The stone trenches will measure roughly two feet wide and one and a half feet deep of washed stone from a half inch to three quarter inch washed stone. And so that will function to, you know, collect and infiltrate stormwater from your, you know, typical uh, rain event um, and uh, certainly provide more infiltration compared to what's there now. Details of the stone trenches are provided on the plan to the left. There's also a detail of the stone retaining wall below the trench drain uh, detail. Um, <clears throat> with respect to regulatory compliance, I'm going to get into that after Holly uh, Samuels overviews the native landscaping plan that she prepared for this project as mitigation. But um, basically, we're providing some, some native landscaping to improve the riverfront area. Uh, and meet the previously developed riverfront area standards at 1050, uh, 310 CMR 1058.5. Um, with our work in the in the floodplain is really just limited to installing the trench drain, which is you know a mitigating measure. We're not changing the grade or displacing any flood storage areas or anything like that with uh, with installation of the trench drain. And then I'll get into a little bit of the climate resiliency component as well. But before I do that, I'm going to turn it over to Holly to overview the uh, planting plan. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Okay. There's the planting plan. Good. Um, so we're proposing uh, planting in the behind the next to and behind the garage as a mitigation planting, um, and it's a. Uh, there's a large silver maple uh, in that area, but I'm uh, no be up above. Uh -huh. Yeah, this large large tree. That's right. Is a there's a large existing silver maple um, to remain, uh, and then some uh, shrubs around that as we can get them in. So not too close to the silver maple, obviously, because it's got a very uh, shallow root system. Some lindir benzoin, some clethra. Um, a hemimelis, so a native witch hazel. Um, and um, the clients also asked for, the homeowners asked for some screening to the bike path. Uh, so there's a row of, um, of uh, dark American arborvitae, so they don't get too large, but to give us some uh, evergreen screening to the bike path. Um, in addition, I put in some uh, perennials, um, and you can see the restoration specific plants on the right hand side. Uh, that's right. So there's a lot of redundancy here so that we can uh, see what, you know, what will survive well in this area. But I've got some ostrich fern, um, some Solomon seal, some, uh, some native asters, some aruncus, some geranium maculatum, some wild geranium. So, and then some Waldsteinia fragoroides as a ground cover, which also continues in other parts of the yard. And then we added some, uh, some boulders right on the edge of that uh, planting area that will undoubtedly come up during construction um, to sort of make it clear that that area shouldn't be mowed in future. And um, then there's other planting in the yard. There's some some trees on the right hand barrier to replace removed uh, Norway maples. And these are some sort of narrow uh, cultivars of uh, liquid ambar or sweet gum, which is a native tree, um, and other ground cover, ground covers in the area. So I think that covers the mitigation planting. If anyone Thanks, has, Holly. Anyone has any questions about that? I'm happy to answer or try. 
Uh, I think it would be best just to conclude your presentation with so Rich said he was going to sure. finish up. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, you know, with respect to the riverfront area regulations, you know, we're increasing our degraded riverfront area by 363 square feet. So we're proposing a two to one ratio of riverfront area restoration and enhancement. That's the land behind the boulders. Um, so the all of the native landscaping that's proposed um, around the house, that's sort of a, a bonus if uh, native planting, if you will. But really the, the two to one is represented um, in the land that's behind the boulders and behind the garage. So the um, so that's how we're meeting the the degraded riverfront area. Plus, we're providing some stormwater management, um, which is a you know added um, environmental benefit compared to the existing condition. With respect to trees, uh, Nicole, could you go to the photograph that shows the the seven trees? There's a cluster of Norway maple trees and a singular a single um, black walnut tree that is. Um, that is off the rear right corner of the house. And they're, they're, they're all less than eight inches. There you go. They're all less than eight inches DBH. This is standing near North Street. The back of the house is to the right. The house that you see is the neighbor's house. So you can see that cluster of trees there. So those really need to be removed in order to accommodate the, um, the crawl space foundation for the addition. And we have a total of 14 trees being installed in addition to the you know 23 shrubs and hundreds of ground cover perennials to offset the impact associated with that tree removal. Um, you know, the climate resiliency really is a, a culmination of all the mitigation that we're proposing. We're proposing a, a fairly robust native planting plan uh, beyond what is required with the uh, addition of the native landscaping outside of the restoration area. Uh, we're providing a commensurate level of stormwater management where none is really required or or um, in the state or local regulations, but we're you know we're still making an effort uh, in order to do that. And then of course the um, the addition itself is outside the the hundred year floodplain and elevated in the landscape. We wanted to make sure that we were we weren't um, displacing any floodplain on the property. So. I think that covers everything that we included in the notice of intent, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thanks, Rich. That was uh, that was well thought out. Thank you. Uh, any commissioners would like to talk about uh, have some questions for this applicant? And right now, I don't see any. I think that's because maybe the sharing screen, but that's fine. I think it's. So it looks like I'm, David White, Susan Chatnick, and Nathaniel Stevens all have their hands up. <laughs> sure. There you go. Stop sharing the screen. Uh, Nathaniel Stevens, let's go with you first. Uh, no, actually, let's, uh, I'm going to defer to David White, who's had, had his hand up for quite a while, yeah. if I may. Thanks. So, it looks like a big improvement to what we have there now. I want to note, however, that No Name Brook is probably perennial. There's water yeah. there all time of year, even in the summertime. Yeah. It's fed by groundwater. So yeah, and it's, it's, you know, we didn't notice, we didn't see any flow when we were out there. We did see the, obviously, the inundated. It sort of starts at that location. Yeah, okay. It starts there. Right. Well, if it is a perennial stream, I don't think it quite meets the state standards based on, you know, the watershed area, because most of that watershed is going to Mill Brook. Um, but we, we claim know. it as a, as a stream under our, under our bylaws. Fair enough. I, I don't think it would necessarily change. Just the, to note that. Yeah, I, I don't think it would change really the permittability of the project because virtually the whole site is in the riverfront area anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it really wouldn't change any of the any of the numbers the you know, too significantly. But uh, noted. Thank you, David. Hmm. Susan, I, so I, I wasn't seeing everybody, so I apologize. So I'm going to go to uh, mm -hmm. Susan, Susan, Susan Chapman. Yeah, I'll go last. Sure. Okay. Susan. Yeah, um, I actually was going to make make a comment similar to David's, but I just want to clarify. Um, in our updated regulations that came out in March of 2023, um, we define um, no name brook. We define three brooks as intermittent streams in the town under the town bylaw. One of them is perennial no perennial streams. 
they're no, no. as intermittent streams. Oh, intermittent. They have okay. an aura. Thank you. Okay. They have an aura, not riverfront. Um, and that's No Name Brook, Coolidge Road Brook, and Ryder Brook. And our aura, as as you might remember, is the hundred foot buffer. And the aura is jurisdictional. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I do appreciate you you thoroughly going through all this. I think that the there's the planting plan looks very robust. I am not a landscape designer, so I can't look at all of those and say they're all natives or okay, but it looks very robust. Um, and that um I appreciate. I appreciate you talking about the climate resilience. I did have one question though. We also had changed our tree replacement policy, which is also in those updated regs. And it wasn't clear to me that your tree replacement was consistent with that. I have to actually look it up myself because I don't yeah. know what the table says unless you know. Well, I, I did. Why don't you continue to look it up while I talk? That sounds good. <laughs> but I do remember before the regulations changed, the commission had a pretty robust uh, tree replacement requirement. And I think on a lot of these smaller lots, it was very challenging to find the space in order to plant um, so many replacement trees, just you know, because you need to um, separate them out and and have enough space so the trees can actually grow and mature and and, and not get in the way of one another. Right. So we we are, um, I believe, at two to one with the fourteen trees that we're proposing. Okay. So I just found it. It's Table F one, tree replacement requirements, and this is this is what we have. I mean, you can have a discussion with the commission on you know, trade-offs between trees and tropes and things like that. But what we have said is that deciduous trees with a DBH of 1.5 inches to six get a two to one. Mm -hmm. If they're greater than six, they get a three to one. Okay. Yeah. All of these are less than eight, but I'm not sure we've okay. got that granular with the, with the Okay. Measure. Okay. Just, I just want to point that out. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, and, and with respect to the native trees i just wanted to, or the native plantings we do have some landscape cultivars in there but um in talking with holly you know i don't think any of those landscape cultivars um adversely affect the function of those plants with respect to wildlife utilization etc um holly is, specializes in the, in this sort of native landscaping she sat on the lexington conservation commission for three years where we you know have similar discussions as we do with this commission so I'm, I'm confident in the planting plan's ability to you know enhance and restore the function and value um i'm not sure if we have much room left for any more trees we are proposing uh, 23 shrubs and all and of course, the you know hundreds of, of ground cover plants, perennials, et cetera. So, um, we we would appreciate yeah. some latitude there. Obviously, you know, with the with the the commission talking through that. Sure. And could you just remind me, or maybe Holly can, the um the trees that, that are being proposed. The trees are the seven uh, liquid ambar, the slender silhouette. Uh, so in this case, it's just a size difference uh, from, it's a cultivar, but it's a, just a size difference. It's not a uh, flower change <clears throat> or, or a foliage color difference or so forth. So they should still provide the same function, but they're going to be able to be screening for this very small lot. To the and, and what and what size would they be when they're, when, what are you proposing to put in? I'm proposing on this side here. Um, okay, hold on. Sure. So our, our I'll just I'll just say our regulations require a DBH of a minimum of one and a half inches. Yeah. So I have it as a gallon size. So I can okay. uh, we can. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. yeah a yeah. ten gallon size. So okay, that's ten gallon. Okay. Gonna be around, around there. And I do appreciate you discussing cultivars. Um, we have had the precedence in in this commission of being concerned about cultivars, but allowing them with justification, specific justification, mm -hmm. that they don't change the ecology or the um, the value of the habitat right. for that. Um, right. Yeah. So I would oh, hope that that's in the materials um, as support for using cultivars. I 
don't know that I saw that. I mean, you mentioned it, but I. Yeah, I don't think we provided actual. Did you? you know, okay. Um, we we did not in, no, include did not. that in the report. Okay. We just re kind of relied on on Holly's expertise with respect to that. Right, and I do appreciate that. I know I know Holly, your um your work in Lexington, and I I, do, I truly appreciate you um being being cognizant about about that and careful about it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the other the other trees are. Uh, the arborvitae, um, and this is a difficult one to get a straight species. Um, it's really kind of impossible to get a straight species arborvitae, and it's also difficult to get um, an evergreen uh, straight species for this situation. Um, so we'd hope that the, I mean, it, it is a a native species, but a cultivar, the dark Americans on the back row. Um, the others are the, the hamamelis. These are, is it more of an understory tree? Um, and then the lindira also becomes a small tree sized, and the clethra will get to be about eight feet at maturity. Um, so they'll be almost like understory, uh, understory trees. The and the others are there's a there is a dogwood. They, the the homeowners asked for a, a flowering tree, so there's a a cross, um, cornus rootgen, which is a stellar pink dogwood. Uh, in the backyard, not in the restoration area. It's a cross between a Kusa dogwood and the native Cornus florida, um, a little more resilient um, than the Cornus florida, um, but a very uh, stable tree and beautiful tree. Um, and then there are a lot of, of uh, native shrubs uh, in the other part of the yard. So Thank you. In yeah. order to get, in order to get some some small lawn area for the the homeowners, um, you know, I've kept the trees to the side, and uh, yeah. that's all. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. That's all I have, Chuck. Okay, um, Nathaniel, why don't you um, ask your question before David? Yeah. Uh, sure. Thanks, um, Rich. Can you just remind me what's your argument? This this is previously degraded riverfront area so there I mean, I sure the um the lot is um is previously developed and you, you have to therefore go through the regulations at 1058 5 which talks about you know we go through them in the report at a minimum your project needs to improve conditions um no I, i'm familiar with, with the performance standards for redevelopment i'm just not totally convinced that you actually are a previously developed riverfront area or the entire or all well, of the riverfront it, sure. previously it, developed i think that, i think everything just, typically when we have these types of projects our approach is the lot itself is previously developed but only a portion of it actually qualifies as degraded which is sort of a subset of previously developed riverfront area. Um, the degraded land is land of structures, pavement, areas lacking topsoil, gravel areas, abandoned dumping grounds, et cetera. So in this lot, we have the, you know, the paved driveway, the, the, uh, the house, the garage, the concrete walkways, et cetera. The rest of it, notwithstanding that forested upland fringe along the southern property boundary, is previously developed, but doesn't qualify as degraded. And the reason that we, we we apply these regulations to this scenario is because if you go through the regulations 1058 it talks about you know the, the amount of degraded area on the site. So you're not allowed to uh, increase the amount of degraded area if the degraded area is already more than 10% of the riverfront area on the lot, which in this case it is, without providing mitigation in accordance with 1058-5 F or G. So we are increasing the degraded riverfront area by 363 square feet, I believe it is. And so therefore we're providing mitigation in the form of restoration and enhancement in accordance with uh, 1058-5G. Um, so, you know, that, that's typically how we go through that al along with the other standards, stormwater management, uh, improving the riverfront area, no closer than 100 feet, et cetera, et cetera. So that's typically how we how we approach it. Okay, thanks. That's helpful to hear. Thank you, David Morgan. Thanks. I'm looking at the planting plan. Some of the smaller 
vegetation, ladies' mantle, cranes' bill, Shasta daisy. Did you address those already, Holly, in terms of justifying the, the choice? Uh, Holly's muted, I think, but the oh, there you go. Right. No, some of these some of these plants are 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 for landscaping decorative purposes, but also rabbit proof. So we have a big problem with what rabbits will eat, and these these plants are not generally eaten by rabbits. Um, on the right side of the house, and on a whole ground cover of um, Carex Pennsylvanica, um, which is a a native sedge, um, and a number of the shrubs that you'll see in different parts of the yard are moved from from the front or from the back to different places. So we're just reusing um, existing material that's on site now. Um, and and uh, adding in, for instance, there's a lot of Ilex glabra shamrock on the on the left side. And then this um, the the uh, Cranesville of Yakovo Cranesville is a real um, is a really good, it's non-native, but it's a it's a geranium, wild geranium ground cover that is um, evergreen and uh, will hold the soil. Um, so we don't have to have a lot of mulch. We can just hold the soil, which will help keep the, the moisture on site too. Um, and again, a rabbit proof. And th those those plants that you're describing, Holly, those are the that's for the aesthetic landscape. <clears throat> it's not for the restoration area in the that's riverfront. Correct. That's correct. But some of it okay. For instance, the crane, the Carex Pennsylvanica, it, you know, it's not in the restoration area, but it's a native ground cover. And mm -hmm. some Solomon seal and so forth in the front. Um, so I've sort of been, it's a sort of a mix of native and and ornamentals on the rest of the lot. Yeah, those ornamentals are still within the aura and the buffer zone to the vegetated wetland. So mm -hmm. I just want to flag that for the commission. I think those may have alternatives. David, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm, I'm not hearing alternatives <laughs> that are more advantageous to habitat value in the buffer zone in Aura. Um, I'm not familiar with the term Aura. I haven't seen, come Oh, that's the, uh, that's the upland uh, resource area that's jurisdictional under the bylaw. It's kind of similar to a, a no disturbance zone or a no structure zone. So There's is that a... within the 25 foot or I want to know where it's, it's actually 100 feet wide. It's 100, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just an upland resource zone. area. Oh, so it's within the 100 foot. Yeah, it, it's what the commission refers to as the 100 foot buffer zone. It's the 100 foot adjacent upland resource area. Mm -hmm. So similar to Lexington, the buffer zone was a resource area as mm -hmm. defined in their bylaw. Mm -hmm. And I flag it principally because this, while these plants are smaller, there's a lot of ground cover, just land area dedicated to them. And so I think it's worth paying closer attention to. Sure. So uh, I'm hearing a lot of questions about the planting plan and I'm, I'm wondering if we've had enough time to review that, but I have some questions um, about this. So Rich, I'm going to just get back to that plan that you brought up, um, the Roper plan. And so I was following the riverfront and I was looking at 10585 and I saw a total riverfront area and, but, and, and I understood that, but you lost me and proposed additional areas. And my question was that are those proposed additional areas part of the a disturbed area? So, or the degraded area? Did you did you count those? So, sure. usually the chart would say something like previously degraded, and then it gives you a total, and then it says proposed degraded, and and then it gives you a total degraded. So we know, and then we can figure out you're over ten percent and how much the mitigation is. And so my real question is. Did you count everything, including the drip trench, for that uh, degraded area? And did you get your two to one for it? Okay, so I'm going to 
Um, bear with me here. So we had a um, conference call, a Zoom call rather, with the entire team, including uh, Scott Lynch over at Rover Survey, and really dialed in every square foot of uh, existing and proposed degraded riverfront area in order to come up with the um, with the with the areas. Now the the trenches, the, the stone trenches, I don't believe we did include those as part of the degraded riverfront area because the regulations exempt from the riverfront area calculation stormwater management infrastructure. So it's a relatively small amount. But I, I don't think we included that because it's, it's it's exempt from regulation. But if you go to, I'm going to share my screen and get into the write up for the um, for the riverfront. I just need to find it because I have a lot of windows open. So bear with me here for just a second. Ah, uh, okay, Zoom. Share screen. Okay. So let me move this over where we get into the. So at a minimum, you know, the project shall result in an improvement over existing conditions for the capacity of the riverfront area to protect the interests. I think it's pretty clear that we that we meet that standard there. Um, Stormwater management is provided according to the standards of the department. That doesn't apply here because it's a single family house. It wouldn't apply under the bylaw because we're under the 350 square foot threshold by design. Uh, the owners were trying to avoid having to go through the you know, hiring a civil engineer. We knew space was limited on the on the property and it would be a you know, significant added cost for this relatively modest addition project. Um, no closer to the river or 100 feet. We are 16 feet closer to Millbrook compared to existing conditions, but we are outside the 100 foot zone. Uh, you know, we also have the the bike path separating our site from Millbrook and to be taken into consideration, I think. Um, 16 feet closer to Millbrook, we're mitigating for that by providing the um, restoration and enhancement in accordance with 1058 5G, but the the big number that you want to talk about is mm -hmm. with, um, this is letter E. The area of proposed work shall not exceed the amount of degraded area, provided that proposed work may have to alter up to 10% of the degraded area is less than 10% of the riverfront area. So if you look at the property, um, you know, the property is 6,000 and something square feet, I believe. We're, we're way over the 10%, right? We're, we're With the existing house driveway, we're over 10%. So the only way that we can increase the amount of degraded riverfront area on the property is to offset that impact by uh, providing mitigation in accordance with 5F or G. So, you know, 5F really isn't applicable here because we really don't have any existing degraded area that we can restore. We're taking full advantage of all the existing degraded area by redeveloping it which minimizes the expansion of the rest of our new degraded riverfront area. So we're at 363 square feet. Um, there we go. We're at 363 square feet of new degraded riverfront area, and we're providing mitigation uh, at a two to one ratio by restoring and enhancing the existing lawn area in the back by 735 square feet, that's two to one. Um, the regulations also allow for um, other mitigation, uh, which results in an equivalent level of env environmental protection. So I would I suggest that here that in, in addition to this two to one ratio of enhancement, we're also providing you know a commensurate amount of stormwater management by you know installing those stone trenches off the back of the addition and um, in an L shape along the edge of the garage. And that L, it's an L shape, so that way we can collect both sides of that pitched roof on the garage. So we're, we're infiltrating all of that runoff from, uh, from both sides of the garage and not just one side. 
so that's how we uh, have demonstrated that we meet the standards for 1058. So you're over 10%, I get that. And so what's what's there is what's there. And yep. anything over that that is impervious would have to be part of that. And you're saying you've added the areas that are not on top of uh, like lawn and whatnot or anything with topsoil comes out to like 360 something square feet. And 363, just, that's right. And then you were able to double that and you had more than that in your uh, mitigation area and you have some additional, I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, everything was added up and I'm glad you, I'm glad that you looked at everything and it's just that that proposed additional area addition area was what was confusing i yeah right I it's, it's understand why that was broken out and it, so i just wanted to ask so that's all there was and the drip trench you're saying is not you can't calculate that because it's storm water and i get that so i think you answered my question okay good i think nathaniel has another question nathaniel Thanks, uh, Rich and Chuck. Um, <laughs> Rich, just uh, FYI, I would take a another look, if you would, at section 33 of our revised regs, because as I heard you explain the stormwater, you're saying because you have less than 350 feet of new pervious surface, you don't have any stormwater sort of standards to meet. And I would beg to differ because I believe we, we tried to rewrite this section to say that we're, we tried to coordinate it with the town's stormwater bylaw, uh, among other things, saying that if you are subject to that bylaw, you need to show compliance prior to us closing the hearing. But we do have some, I would say, more less stringent standards to meet, even if you don't require a stormwater bylaw permit to okay. take a look at, such as uh, no, do not act, exacerbate or create flooding conditions and do not uh, increase the peak rate of stormwater runoff. The second one roughly is reduce the stormwater pollution to the maximum extent uh, possible using LID uh, techniques, and then have a written operation maintenance plan for any BMPs there. Uh, we also then asked to use the NOAA Atlas, NOAA, NOAA 14 um, standards for calculations rather than the uh, Cornell, which we sure. used to require or TP uh, 40. So just FYI on that. I, so I so is that on this project, but just going going forward. I'm sorry. Could you say that last part again? I I misunderstood. Sure. Um, sorry. I whichever one. I I was just saying that the other standard is to have a uh, use the NOAA 14 plus data. Yeah. Cornell or uh, TB40. Right. So, so are are you suggesting that the revised regulations require applicants to hire a civil engineer to run the pre and post calculation, given the parameters you just described, regardless of even if it's just a, a small increase in impervious it's, area? Any I, increase in impervious that's area? That's why I got asked. The yeah, I well, I guess I'm having more problem with you saying that the 350 uh, there's a 350 cutoff because it's not reflected in our regulations don't we're not intended to reflect that but um yes i think that and i'll i'd ask the other commissioners to weigh in on this because i think that's what we were anticipating um that there would be some demonstration of these meeting these standards right because the only way to demonstrate there you know the the no increase in the um pre and post would to be to frankly do a full analysis mm -hmm. by a civil engineer without, you know, even for, you know, I don't know, is, is there a cutoff? I guess if there's not a cutoff and we're increasing by 50 square feet, then I just want to make sure that that's, that's what the expectation is. Right. Can, yeah. Can and, I just and, interject, Nathaniel? Sure. Go ahead. I um, also, yeah. Cause uh, I was just reading that, that section again, it's section yeah. 33 of our updated regs. We do have a, a, Final line in there. Yes, I was going to discuss that. Yep, the requirements yep, of this H, section yep. shall be administered by the commission commensurate with the nature, scope, type, and cost of the proposed project or activity, 
which I think we put in there just for these types of reasons yeah. Yeah. Okay. that we want to have these discussions, but for very small projects, we can use judgment. I think that's what. Yes. Thanks. Is. Okay. That's what I was going to add to. But yeah, I just want to impress upon Rich that you're not completely exempt under our, our fair enough bylaw regulations. Thanks. Okay. So let's uh, let's see if anyone attending tonight's uh, meeting would like to say something, um, uh, maybe in a butter to this property. So you can use the raise hand functions uh, to, uh, so the reaction buttons to use the raise hand function and uh, we'll see you or you could just wave and we will see you doing that also. Chuck, we, there's a comment in the chat uh, from a Holly Samuels that says, I'm here, but don't see myself. Can I be, can oh, I? Oh, that's, that's Holly, our-, our Oh, you're that Holly. Was earlier. <laughs> okay. Earlier. That was from earlier. Thanks. Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, back to the commission. I am. I don't have a sense of this. Is this is, is for more comments or um, or maybe more comments first? Uh, we, we had a lot of discussion about the plants. Some of them weren't native cultivars, um, and then some stormwater requirements. If we flush those out, and someone wants to make a, a motion or would we like a little bit more time to review this and ask for some more additional, some additional information? I personally would like a little more additional information. I would like more on the planting plan, um, considering replacing the non-natives because it is in our jurisdictional area in the aura, the adjacent upland resource area, which I think the applicant didn't understand fully before. Um, uh, justification for using cultivars, um, you know, that, that were chosen. Um, and I didn't see an invasive management plan proposed. I might've missed it because I, I may have. <laughs> um, and if it wasn't, if it was there or wasn't there or, or some kind of discussion about how invasives would be controlled um, on this. And then for the stormwater, um, I would like to see some justification um, about you know just addressing that section of our regulations and you know with some explanation about why um, what is pro being proposed is is um, commensurate with the project and you know climate resilient, um, which personally I think it is, but um, I think we need that in there because it is part of our regulations. Okay. Uh, anybody had anything else? For, I sure. tried that information to make a decision. Any other comments? I, I echo Susan's request for that information. Any other comments from the commission or motions to continue? To we would be March twenty first. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Rich. Uh, yeah. Are you okay with us uh, requesting a continuance to March twenty first? I think so. Yeah, I'm just putting it in my calendar. Okay. I'll make a motion to continue to March 21st. Your second? I'll second. Okay. Um, Mike Gill, this game. Yes. David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Tarani says yes. Thank you all very much okay. for your time and thoughtful consideration of this application. And I just have one quick question. New information for the March 21st hearing would be due March 14th, the week before. Is that correct? It's the Wednesday at noon. So ah, the 13th at noon. Okay. I believe David has a published schedule up. Yes. On the website just. Yeah, I, I'm just rem remembering that now when he said yeah. noon. I've <laughs> that job. <laughs> yes. All right. Very good. Thank you all very much again. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Have a good night. Yep. Okay. So uh, I want to make a change to the agenda. I think it would be best if we took on uh, the request of determination of applicability 
for 459 Mystic Street now, and then left the rest of the time tonight for, um, it's basically going to be Thorndike Place because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we're going to take a vote to continue 88 Coolidge. So, Susan, if that's okay with you, because I know that you're going to take this project on, if you could um, start to introduce 459 Mystic Street. Sure. Um, this is a request for determination of applicability um, at 459 Mystic Street. This public hearing will consider this request for the construction of an addition and a deck expansion at this property. It's within the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands. And um, myself, Chuck Taroni, and Ryan um, Clapp did a site visit. Um, what was that date? I forgot that date, Ryan. But <laughs> time passes. So it was on March 1st. March 1st, thank last you. Last Friday. Right, last Friday. <laughs> um, and uh, to understand the project better. And I think, Ryan, were you going to explain it? And we do have Scott Grady here, who is the project architect. Uh, yeah, so I can give an overview, or if Scott wanted to give an overview of the project, and then I can kind of fill in the gaps, whichever one. Scott, would you like to do that? Or would you happy like to. Ryan to do? Okay, that'd be great. And then somebody should put up the plan, mm -hmm. um, whoever has it handy. All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are proposing a oh, modest... Scott, with... could you just introduce yourself again formally? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Scott okay. Grady, uh, Scott William Grady, architect. I am the architect for the proposed addition uh, to the residence at 459. Thank okay. you. All right. And uh, yeah, like I say, we're proposing a very modest addition at the rear of the house. And at the rear of the house at this time, uh, there is an existing uh, covered enclosed porch and a covered uh, basement access. Uh, totaling about 172 square feet, giving us 172 square feet of existing impervious surface. Uh, a portion of that screen porch shall be removed, about 86 square feet, and the uh, covered basement access will be removed, 22 feet. So we're removing 108 square feet of the existing impervious surface. Um, we are introducing, in our addition, 77 square feet. Uh, which added to the uh, remaining uh, 86 square feet of the enclosed porch will now put us at a total of 163 square feet of impervious surface. So we're reducing the amount. Uh, and then as Susan had mentioned, there is also a, a small expansion, a five foot by 10 foot uh, of a deck that will be supported by a pier and uh, the decking will be open to allow drainage. And uh, it's, Basically, that's simple. So I'm open to any questions you may have, or you can add what you need to those of you who visited with me on the site. So I will just add that what we found when we went on site, you may you may have seen the the lines um, of the hundred foot. They were they were actually not quite in the right place on the site. So Chuck took his handy dandy tape measure, <laughs> and we walked it out from the resource area. Um, just to make sure we understood where the 100 feet um, jurisdictional area was. Um, and and if I could get, share my yeah. screen, I can yeah. show where the... Uh, That'd know, be great, Ryan. Thank you. We, got, we have some pictures from that site visit as well, and that'll kind of help visualize where that 100 foot buffer zone is. Uh, so yeah, so this is the site, and you can see uh, on the tree here, it's marked with a piece of flagging tape. Uh, so if you are drawing a straight perpendicular line uh that would be where the 100 foot buffer zone is uh so just about bisecting scott right there <laughs> <laughs> um whereas on the plans that would have been set back about another 10 15 feet to the uh to the right there is where that would be reflected on the uh on the plans, it looks like there was just a different scale that was used when the survey was done versus when the uh, the layers for the buffer zone was added. Hmm. So just to clarify, so it's a hundred feet towards the house from the flag. No, no, no. Um. So the the, the the wetland is all the way on the uh, the left there. 
so we are looking perpendicular at the house right now uh so the 100 foot buffer zone would be right let me see oh i got it so it's it starts from the left of the picture and i would yeah i don't know if you can see my mouse but the wetland yep. is way over way over this way okay oh, thank you that thanks for orienting me so the deck is definitely within the buffer zone yes okay thanks so so susan are you uh do you want to talk about the addition in the in the screen porch and all that there or does maybe does scott wants to talk about that or or i can anybody <laughs> sure um, so, but yeah well, go ahead chuck yeah sure so what, what we have here is we have this porch and that porch is proposed to be taken down and if you cut that porch in half um that's where the addition will be and it comes all the way out to the corner of the house so we're going to remove the entire porch and that bulkhead and bring let's say that those screens are three feet each so it's six feet six feet off the house all the way to the corner so it's a six foot by whatever i don't know 24 foot 24. addition yep. yeah 24 foot addition and where the screen porch has been eliminated, and you'll notice that it has a roof, um, they're just going to fill in the decking material. And decking uh, is considered pervious, uh, you know, with this commission uh, and past um, determinations. So at the end of the day, with removing the deck and bulkhead, this actually decreases impervious area within the aura and um again on this screen there's a stream that runs uh from the street and it's basically just past the uh just past the stream porch it's it's just on the other side you're almost looking at it from where you are here so there's a lot of lawn uh they're quite far away from the mystic and they're they're um the the project starts uh the project starts 80 feet away from that stream and the stream is lined it's got an armor bank it's stone in this area which is still a bank but but uh, there's plenty of lawn in front of it um so that's what i know about the project uh and i hope that's helpful you said that better than i could have so thank you Thanks, Chuck. I see that um, David Morgan has his hand up and then Nathaniel. Can somebody remind me how we treat Herbert Minor Brook in terms of jurisdictional areas? How we treat a what? The the brook. I think it's got Herbert the Minor. it's got an aura. But not riverfront area? I'm not sure. You know, it's very interesting because. I didn't even know the name of this brook. It's really a culvert stormwater conveyance system from- it's Herb Meyer. Excuse me? It's Herb Meyer brook. Oh, okay. Mm. All right. Um, we I really can't bear it. It's culvert. Yeah. area in the past, right? Oh, we did? Years ago, when they okay. were, when the Winchester Country Club was doing yes. work upstream. Country Club work. Yeah. It's mapped as such, which is why I asked. And good point. I mm -hmm. Don't see. Well, I, I didn't see it reflected on the plans, of course, and didn't see it exempted in our regulations. You know the way that No Name Brook is, for example. So, just wanted to raise that point. Mm -hmm. Good point. I wasn't aware of. I, I guess I wasn't on the commission when this was considered. No, it was like 20 years ago. Okay. 15 years ago. Okay. Um, so if you went through those yeah, standards, yeah. you would you would realize that, so um, at a minimum, the proposed work shall um, result in a improvement over the existing conditions. We'll be looking for that. There's no B, there's no storm water needed for single family homes. Within the first 200 feet of the riverfront, the proposed work should not be any closer, and that hasn't happened. We've actually got further away. 
and D, uh, the proposed work, um, including expansion, will, shall be located outside the riverfront or towards the riverfront boundary. And again, we're, we've said that they're moving it back towards the, yeah, I think they're moving it back. Let me just think about that. So the riverfront's here. Yeah, well, you guys can think about that one. It's, uh, it's, 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 Within the, to the yeah, river front of yeah, yeah, yeah. So the river, the river kind of does an S thing, so it's not. It's but not there's straight, no other spot yeah. to put it. But that right, gets right. them to F and G, which is right. uh, mitigation or restoration. And then right. the proposed work shall not exceed um, the ten percent. I, I would say with the size of this lot, they may not be over ten percent. But that calculation is not available to us. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, a, it's an RDA, right? It's not right. even an NOI. So no. our question is, do we want an NOI? It's clearly right. with the jurisdiction. Right. Uh, clearly, it's jurisdictional. We are seeing well, that's why I went through impervious, the, uh... but we, yeah, that, that was a good point. We, meaning me at least, was not considering Riverfront. I was just considering Aura. So. Well, I realize, I, I realize that, but I was just going through there to see what was missing and mm -hmm. I would say what's missing here is some sort of mitigation or restoration out of those if, if it was uh, a notice of intent and we did go through 10585. But for the record being the one who raised it I'm not recommending that we bump it up to an NOI I think Chuck's rundown sufficiently conveyed that this doesn't pose any additional problems, but I do think Chuck's right about adding mitigation or restoration into the consideration of conditions for the RDA. Nathaniel, did you have anything else? Your hand no, is I'm up. sorry. Uh, I was going to ask Chuck what his recommendation was about okay. NOI or not. And I think I, in the tone of his voice, he seems to be saying no, no NOI. But he may be changing his mind if we're on <laughs> areas involved. But, and I'm just saying, if, we're, if we want to put conditions in, we should really be doing an order, not a, if, if we have too many conditions. I think if the commission wouldn't accept some sort of mitigation for this work, then we should ask for a notice of intent. Um, with, if, we, if you wouldn't accept mitigation in the form of planting, or there was a stream at the very end. I don't know if we have pictures of that, but that stream at the very end, the bank was deteriorating and we could ask for some certain square footage of bank restoration or something like that. But again, that's a little bit much to ask for in a RDA. So maybe find out what the commission thinks. Is this an RDA as presented or would someone like to make another comment or make a motion? Um, I, I'd be okay with an RDA. I just, I would like to see some supplemental information, maybe continue this hearing and just see the explanation of how it meets the performance standards of the redevelopment performance standards. And maybe that's an opportunity to add um, proposed mitigation. Um, but yeah, I think it's the same footprint and reducing a pervious surface. Um, you know, it's still touching on the other jurisdictional resource areas, but mm. I think the only thing that we haven't yet resolved is the um, the riverfront area uh, implications. Sure. So continuation with uh, with some additional material. I think that would give at least me a chance to check stream stats out because, I, and I don't know, David, you may have done this and that's why you're, uh, you feel clear about that, but I didn't think of it. It just looked like, well, it just looked like a small little tiny stream that was probably uh, intermittent. I actually Any just stopped sharing so I could run a stream stats report and just looking at the easiest one to look at real quick was the probability of it flowing per, uh, perennially. And that gave an 89% chance, so. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there you go. If I uh, may speak just on behalf of uh, of my clients, I, I know yeah. we're appreciative of the ability to move forward 
uh, sooner rather than later on this project uh, as uh, summer's coming up and uh, contractors are hoping to begin soon and the proposal is modest and we are improving the condition. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to speak out on behalf of their goals. If okay. I hadn't been to the yeah. site and put my feet on it, I would, with this information, say it would probably be an NOI because of Riverfront. But having been there and seeing how modest it is, where the additions are, the fact that the impervious surface is decreasing, I'm trying to get my head around, can we do an RDA with a condition of a you know modest amount of mitigation plantings? Because I really don't think this is having an, a negative impact on riverfront area, having seen it. Now, many other commissioners haven't seen it. So maybe that's something <clears throat> you need to do to feel comfortable or make a decision. I know my clients would absolutely be open to uh, so, you know, modest mitigation of, of but plantings and such, uh, if that was helpful to the commission. Thank you. I think it would be for me if you if you could propose something for them for us to review at the next hearing in two weeks. That would, be, sure. I think that would move things hopefully in the right direction. Okay, that's great. I think we got a little bit of direction here. I'm just going to speed this up a little bit. So we're going to continue this to our next meeting, and. You can reach out to the office and David Morgan will provide you the 10.585 standards and you'll just answer each one of those questions and you'll find out that you need to provide mitigation. And that could be planting, that could be bank restoration, that could be uh, something else, but you need to improve uh, the capacity of the river to um, the habitat. I don't have it in front of me, but I think that's what you you want to do. Let me see what it is. Right. And but David can work with you on on the scope of the mitigation commensurate with your project. So that's always a, an issue. We don't we don't anticipate that you would propose to restore the entire bank of this entire river from Mystic Street down to uh, that, that's the appreciated. Lake. Thank you. No, you know, <laughs> because of the because it should be commensurate with your project. And Thank and David that. could help you work work on that. Yeah. The bank restoration would be uh would be something else, but uh usually it's 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 planting, but you'll have a chance to talk to David, our, our uh, conservation agent, uh, about that. That'd be great because it's a huge learning curve for me. Um, I'm used to the house stuff, so this is uh, this is okay. all. Great. It's fun. So right? I'm hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, yeah. listening to the other projects, it's actually fascinating. It's quite a learning curve. Great. And, uh, all all your attention to so many details is very much appreciated. I'll make a motion to continue this to our meeting on the twenty first. Great. I'll second. Great. Mike Gildas came? Yes. David White? Yes. David Kaplan? Yes. Susan Chapnick? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Sorry, did we lose Brian again? Or is Brian here? I'm still here. No, oh, then you have Brian. to ask him to vote. <laughs> yeah. Brian, can you can vote. Brian. I'll be a yes. I'll Brian be a yes, Brian. too. Hi, <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> Or Susan. <laughs> all right, David, I look forward to uh, meeting and speaking with you, and I'll see you all in two weeks then. Thanks, Scott. All right, thank you very much. All right. All right. Do you want to just, uh, can I get a motion to continue 88 uh, Coolidge to um, March 21st? So moved. And second. Second. Susan Chapnick? Yes. David White? Yes. Brian McBride? Yes. Mike Gildesgame? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. Brian McBride? Just kidding. Uh, Chuck Taroni says yes. Did I forget anyone? David White, did I forget you? No, I think I started with you. Okay. At least that was a quorum. So whoever's missed.
That's enough. So now we're going to turn to um, Thorndike Place. So I have a, some preliminary comments. Uh, I hope you'll find these helpful. Uh, tonight's hearing will be limited to a discussion uh, on. Dave, David's recusing himself. I'm recusing myself. Sure. David White is recusing himself of this hearing. So tonight's hearing will be limited to a discussion regarding the third party review of the habitat evaluation peer review. The Conservation Commission is not finished with our stormwater review and will be requesting a continuous at the end of this hearing to our March 21st Conservation Commission. Our consultant, Chase Bernier, SWCA, will bring us up to date on where he is uh, with this with this uh, review, and then the proponents from BSC will chime in and bring us up to date uh, uh, with what they know. And then I'm going to ask staff for any w any updates if they have them. David White, can you uh, mute yourself, please? Thanks. Uh, let's see. And then I'm going to take uh, some questions and comments from the commissioners. And you can all hear them, and uh, then we'll turn to um, the public, and we'll hear from the public at that point. So that's what I'd like to follow, and uh, that's all we're going to be talking about tonight. So no other discussion points will be entertained. So this is only about the habitat um, third body review that we had. So with that, uh, SWCA and Chase, would you introduce yourself for the record? Sure. Uh, Chase Bernier, uh, uh, Natural Resources Team Lead with uh, SWCA. Um, just a little quick uh, history, to, you know, my involvement with this project. Um, previously conducted a site visit um, of the site of the restoration areas um, with um, representatives of the applicant with, you know, BSC and of the commission. Um, we issued our uh, peer review uh, letter report on January uh, 23rd. Uh, there's a total of 10 comments um, of uh, the restoration plan and the planting plan and whatnot. Um, we received comments back from the applicant that addressed a uh, almost all of those uh, all of those comments, which which is great. Um, so we issued um, a response to those comments. Um, I think we've got most of those addressed as well. Uh, Matt, I believe you sent us. My apologies, I had this pulled up and then my computer crashed, so I hit the reboot. So give me one second here. Um, so you sent a uh, email noting that we had a couple of comments on the plans that you guys are working on um, revising and, and getting those to the commission, which is great. Um, and then we had one more comment about, excuse me, uh, related to the invasive species management plan that we had um, recommended that that be submitted to the commission for review uh, before the order was issued. So I see that you have submitted that as well. Um, I gave that a quick once over uh, before the meeting. I haven't really dug, dug into that at all, but it looks, you know, uh, superficially pretty good. Um, I don't see any kind of glaring red flags or anything like that. Um, but like I said, I haven't had any time to really get into the, the meat and potatoes of it. Um, did the commission want me to go uh, comment by comment? Or have you had a chance to take a look at the peer review um, kind of correspondence back and forth? I, I know it's running late, so I don't want to go through all 10 comments if, uh, if there weren't any questions. I would actually appreciate not delving into all the comments, but if you could put them up or somebody could, and we could actually revisit some of the comments where it wasn't just, this is resolved, this is resolved. I mean, you could at least sure. state what the comment is like a summary, just one sentence summary yep. that are going through the three paragraphs and say, this one's resolved, or this one's not resolved, and what is your recommendation? That would be helpful to me. Sure, sure. Okay. Is that okay, Chuck? With you? No, that's fine. Okay. And I'm sorry, did I hear Chase say that the uh, applicant has, had submitted a invasive uh, species management plan today? I didn't. Yes. Recently? Yeah. Yes. Did that just come in today? I didn't see it. 
Uh, it, uh, it did. Okay. All right. Yeah, I guess I would request more time to review that. So I, I think, yeah, especially any materials coming in today, because I saw Chase's last, or be it, mm -hmm. I can't remember. Yep. Yeah, Chase's, um, Chase's right letter actually. came just came yesterday, which was yeah. also just very quick to review. So I yes, I do right, agree we might need more time, but I, I would like a very quick summary so we all, all are on the same page. Yeah. Cool. Uh, comment one. Um, just, you know, I'll just maybe do a quick overview. Of what I, you know, so comment one had to do um, with um, the removal of uh, snags that has been resolved. Uh, no issues there. Uh, comment to um, deal, deal specifically with the invasive species. Uh, Chase, do, before, yep. do, you want, Sorry, do you want to go through all these or do you want us to ask questions as we come up on things? I mean, I, Susan, what was that? I don't, I don't remember what you want, why you wanted him to go over this. Was it an opportunity for us to ask questions? Yeah, I wanted yeah, him to do exactly what he's doing, which is just spend one and sentence. Should we stop saying, him? Say, and we'll just stop him if we have a question, okay. you know. And so then Chase keep going on the, to the uh, next one. Yep, yeah. Yep. Okay. So Chase, uh, on on response number one, I was hoping that um, it it just recommends cutting down. Uh, I'm going to call them danger snags, but mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was if um, there was a possibility if there was uh, we could leave them like if it was possible that it wouldn't cause a danger ten to fifteen foot tall. Leave something there. Um, because it seemed like it was either all or nothing with how you uh, wrote that response. I mean, that, yeah, that, that was something that I think we could talk to the applicant about. Um, you know, I, I, I believe the way the way I read the comment of how they changed it was that the um, snags that were going to be proposed um, would be. Um, brought before the commission or their representative uh, for approval. Correct. But instead, so I wanted to add to that, if it was okay with, you know, this is, this would be my mm -hmm. uh, insert, I guess on that would be, it would be left, it would be cut down flush, or it would be left as a snag that's 10 to 15 foot tall or some appropriate size. And obviously, it can't fall into right. where people would be, but you know that has to be taken into consideration. I see yeah. that uh, David Kaplan has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. And just a comment too. It does sound like BSC is giving us a lot of latitude to coordinate, I guess, and approve any stag removal. Um, so that's appreciated. Um, but also, I just wanted to throw in the comment that. I wouldn't want to prioritize leaving a snag if it somehow um, impacts the restoration areas, you know, restoration plantings, I guess. So, you know, if there's a conflict between, you know, a snag and a restoration planting, I would prefer, you know, a um, uh, like stump grinding and replanting, you know, clearing that slate to give a restoration plant as much opportunity to thrive in that section as possible. But that that's a, just a quick comment. So whoever's reviewing that and make sure that we, you know, we, we can have that latitude. Yeah, I think yeah, there's I clearly there's gonna be a, an area where the restoration planting is and then a little bit outside of that area where it seemed like, a, larger snag may be cut. Okay, good comment. Thank you. Chase? Um, any other questions on uh, comment one? Seeing none. Okay. Uh, comment two um, deals specifically with the uh, invasive species management plan. Um, originally, the applicant had proposed to uh, develop a um, management plan um, as a uh, special condition to, for the uh, as part of the order conditions. We had recommended that that plan be developed prior to the issuance of an order conditions, um, which they ha which they have done. Um, like I said, I haven't um, specifically gone through the. Um, the intricacies of it yet, but it looked it looks pretty it looked pretty well done from from what I've seen. 
Um, but I imagine that the commission would uh, like a more further or a, a more in depth review of that before we, we kind of talk about that. Any questions on that one? Uh, I, I agree with that. Okay. Uh, comment three refers to um, uh, different kinds of refuse and garbage and whatnot that has been dumped on the site. Uh, we recommended that the commission include a condition um, in the order of conditions um, that requires all sufficient refuse to be, you know, properly disposed of and and um, and and whatnot, and that any kind of any that's basically buried real deep into the soil be left there so we're not you know disturbing a shopping cart or something that has been buried you know two feet on underground or, or whatnot um bsc concurred with that so i think i think we have resolved um that one um any any questions on uh comment three okay well yeah I'm just, sorry and may maybe it's not with three but it's more maybe more of a general comment but you know as mm -hmm. you remove that um, refuse and open up opportunities for planting. Did you come across anything in your review that indicated that soil amendments may be needed or or recommended to, you know, for the plantings that the proposed, um, you know, to be successful? Or are we are you fairly confident that you know the existing substrate there would support any kind of restoration plantings that they're proposing? I think it's probably okay by the time we take out all you know the trash and and whatnot i don't see any and and what the and what's been proposed you know is is um you know um currently on on site you know i know they're going to revise their plan to uh you know better represent um the existing communities and whatnot so g given that you know the adjacent site the adjacent um sites to the rep to the restoration area are you know, kind of flourishing, I, I think they'll be fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and just to kind of, you know, to kind of piggyback on that a little bit, the um, restoration plan and the um, comprehensive burn also say that, you know, after I think it's believe three years, um, it's an 80% survival rate. So anything that is not meeting that would there be a corrective action plan associated with that. So there is a little bit of insurance with that as well. Okay, no, that's a good point. Thank you. Yep. Comment four um, discussed the inclusion of some other types of um, wildlife habitat, including you know large woody debris, um, rocks and rock piles, that type of thing. Um, in, the, uh, in addition to the proposed plantings and whatnot, um, they have VSC has updated those plans to include um, a bunch of different a variety of um, options. I think there was a brush pile, a um, couple of, you know, a vernacular rock pile and whatnot. Um, so I thought that was great to see. Um, I'm encouraged that they included that. Um, any questions on uh, comment four? Great. Yeah. Continue on to comment five. Um, had to do with the uh, planting plan. Um, I, I think I mentioned this already before that the originally the planting plan had included um, some some species that um, weren't in, already on site, um, and that there were I thought there were opportunities to uh, better represent the existing conditions, you know, adjacent habitats by including species um, that were already there uh, as opposed to plant, introducing new species. So. Um, in their revised plans, um, some of those things, some of those species were, uh, or their the originally proposed species were still um, still included. Uh, I understand that BSC is currently revising uh, those plans to address that. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be great to see those uh, when they come in, and I appreciate you uh, addressing that. Um, oh, uh, any comments or questions on uh, comment five? So yeah. my only question is we didn't we didn't get that yet, right? So we got an Correct. invasive management plan, but not the revised restoration. Okay. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah. Okay. I believe that's coming so, in the next couple of days. Uh and with uh in reading Matt's uh email. 
to was your recommendation do you think that it all um uh constrains the amount of you know, biodiversity that we could potentially add to this area you know i, I understand where you're coming from that mm -hmm. what's there is most likely to be successful um but you know some of the restoration projects you know i've had the opportunity to work on usually the approach is kind of look at a native plant community you know as part of the nhesp uh mm -hmm. communities and sort of pick your palette from you know what that area wants to be if it's not disturbed or what it could be if it weren't mm -hmm. disturbed um is that do you find that is does your comment it overly potentially constrain i guess the amount of biodiversity or that that uh, restoration approach in any way I don't necessarily think so. Um, one, one of kind of the pillars of restoration is understanding, you know, what your baseline is or your reference area is, um, with the understanding that you know we we could plant whatever we wanted there, you know, cypress, you know, all kinds of crazy things that if we really wanted to, but you know, is that really representative of the existing habitats? Are they going to contribute and enhance the existing habitats as opposed to just you know, are, or are we just including additional species for the sake of adding additional species. So um, in the right. case of this particular site, I think it makes more sense to add species that, you know, native species that we know are there and are doing well, and it's going to contribute and enhance the, you know, the available habitats um, that are there. Okay. No, that sounds like a similar approach. Okay. Thank you very much. Comment six, or moving into you know the away from the narrative and into the site plans. Um, comment six um, referred to uh, some of the uh, planting note uh, note seven, um, and that uh, had to do with um, specific you know indicating the proposed planting uh, species sizes quantities you know maybe subject to change on availability and you know, and whatnot. So we recommended that um, some additional language um, be included that basically says that, um, you know, any um, proposed changes would be uh, presented to the commission or their agent prior to um, uh, prior prior to the substitutions being made. Um, and BSC has made those um, revisions, uh, which we appreciate. Any comments on six? Let's see. So, uh, administrative approval. Okay. Yeah, I guess the commission uh, needs to decide if they want that to be commission or administrator. I think generally we do administrator on things like that. Right. Um, David, do you feel supported enough to make those decisions? I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Right. I also feel like that question and I had some others that I didn't bring up as we were going over this I wanted to discuss you know with the commission you know when we we're discussing conditions uh, if we ever got to that point so um, I'm going to res reserve my comment on whether David should do it or the commission should do it until that point uh, and there's a few other things that I thought the same it's Moving on to comment seven, um, this uh, again was to in, in reference to uh, one of the notes. Um, it says it notes that uh, the dumping of woody vegetation, brush, and other debris in a resource area uh, was prohibited. Uh, it, BSC um, basically said that you know that language comes directly from the comprehensive permit um, that the commission uh, provided comment on prior to. So I think that makes sense, and we, we don't need we don't need to. Uh, provide any kind of uh, additional conditions on top of that. Uh, common eight is kind of on the, on the same note. Um, we had mentioned this earlier with about the plantings um, and that um, as part of the comprehensive permit, the um, planted species, uh, or it says that the planted species shall have um, an 80% uh, survival rate by the end of the third year. Uh, we had recommended that um, you know, that you know, if that eighty percent wasn't being met, you know, kind of year over year, 
that a corrective action plan um, be, be developed um, to kind of catch that ahead of time. Um, but again, that language comes right from the comprehensive permit that you know, the commission has already um, uh, commented on and it's been, has been issued. So we didn't see a need to um, add additional um, you know, conditions on, on top of that. Any questions before uh, moving on to the next question? So, yeah, I had a question about that. So my notes say that SWCA recommends that the commission consider requiring a comprehensive action plan. Is now you're saying that there's one in the comprehensive permit? Yeah, so that yeah, that language comes from the comprehensive permit. And our, our comment was to say, you know, say, you know, you plant the plants and you know, you, the first year first year of monitoring you out there and you had 60% mm -hmm. survival or something of that nature. Um, under the language of the comprehensive permit, it states that 80% um, survival is required by the th end of the third year, where we were recommending that it would, you know, we, a corrective action plan should be developed at the end of each year to get ahead of that. Um, but since that language is as it is in the comprehensive permit, uh, we felt that it made sense to uh, leave it as is and not, and, and not to um, add additional conditions on top of that, since the commission has already um, commented or provided comment and review uh, as part of the comprehensive permit. I, I do agree we should be consistent with the comprehensive permit. I do have to go read it again because I think that it does have requirements for replanting. Um, so it's not like just, oh, you know, you're not at 80 percent at the end of three years too bad you know there oh, are no, no, sure. yeah, there, there there's specific are, requirements yes right. so it, it does yeah. have to meet that 80 percent at the end of the, right, uh, right, end of right. the i years. see yeah yeah so i uh, so i personally would would i'm going to go back and read that myself anyway just to familiarize myself with it but i think we are protected in that respect thank you so so i would assume that we could only so if this wasn't covered by the wpa we couldn't make that change if it was a bylaw requirement that, I mean, you're, you're making a suggestion. It seems like if the commission wanted to take it up under the Wetlands Protection Act, I think that that would, it seems like a good idea. It also seems like a good idea for the applicant to uh, take up. I just, it just wastes a lot of time and the monitoring period and all that. Um, you know, if you start, if you replant in the third year, you you know, you're starting your monitoring all over again. So it is a good idea to just replace them as needed. I think Matt has his hand up. I'm not sure if he's going to address this issue. Matt Byrne. If, if it's okay, I, I appreciate that to the chair. Um, thanks for the summary. I just, since we're in on this topic, um, that comprehensive permit requirement was based on the Conservation Commission's recommendation to the zoning board. So, so that's why we're recommending not increasing the frequency of, uh, you know, needing, you know, the trigger, the thing that's gonna trigger a uh, corrective action. So, so that's all. We just, um, we just wanted to stick with your own recommendation. And I hear you, Chuck, um, about, that we could do something else under the WPA, but I think the WPA also has a two-year, not a three-year monitoring period. And this is not about monitoring. This is about checking to see if things need to be replaced during that monitoring period. So mm -hmm. we've agreed on a three-year, but only to review that gotcha. at the end of those three years. Mm -hmm. So Matt, I, it sounded like reluctant, I mean, did I hear you say like reluctantly we have to follow the comprehensive permit? And maybe this is a good idea, or, or am I trying to? No, I, trying to no, that's not what I, said. <laughs> I, I think that you know, following the comprehensive permit because it is based on your recommendations to the zoning board is what we should do. Okay, enough said on that. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, comment nine um, refers to or, or deals with um, the planting plan, and the planting schedule. Um, there are there were a couple of um, uh, cultivars that were uh, proposed uh, within the buffer zone. We recommended that those um, cultivars be removed. Um, 
and that um, you know native plantings uh, be 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 proposed instead. Um, so BSC agreed. Um, it looked like the plans that we saw still included some of those. So I understand that those are being uh, revised to to address that. Um, so we appreciate that very much. And then, oh, uh, uh, comments on uh, comment nine or questions on comment nine. Okay. And then our uh, last comment, comment 10, um, deals with a uh, note on the plans. Again, that kind of goes back into the, or refers back to the, uh, one of the earlier comments about snags um, and um, that we, again, recommended that um, the note be added that only snags that pose a hazard be, be removed and that, um, you know, any snags that do propose to be removed uh, be approved by the commission. Um, and then, um, uh, BSC uh, agreed with that, but we also noted that um, that the the note on the plans um, doesn't. It's, it's been revised, but it didn't indicate that the commission um, would be uh, would, would approve those. So those are be that 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 note is being revised as part of the uh, the next submission as well. And that's it. Any uh, any questions on anything we, that we uh, went over? Uh, thank you for running through those. That was helpful. Mm. Absolutely. Any other comments from the Conservation Commission? No, I guess just, sorry to summarize, so we are waiting for revised plans, right? And also Chase's review, more thorough, thorough review of the invasive management uh, plan that was submitted sometime today. Yeah, so that's what comment two and comment five seem to be follow-ups in uh, invasive management, and the other one is BSC is uh, revising the plans. That's what I wrote. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to see where we were procedurally on that. Thanks. Okay, uh, any other comments from the commissioners? Uh, I, I, did, I did want to make just one quick comment because I, I just was reading through the comprehensive permit quickly just because we were talking about that. So the comprehensive permit does say that all, all mitigation plantings um, within resource areas shall be native non cultivar species. Um, just, just putting that out there, which is a comment that SWCA made. Um, and then it, it does talk about um, that the the plantings um, and invasive species removal uh, shall be monitored for three years. The survival rate of 80% is in there. Survival rate of less than 80% after the end of the third year, the applicant must submit proposed recommendations for replacement to the board, that's the ZBA, for its review and administrative approval. A monitoring report shall be submitted annually so we are getting annual monitoring reports on these restoration plantings. That's already in um, comprehensive permit I-25 condition. Okay, so just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Thank you. And those uh, those those notes that you just read are also part of this plan. So the contractor will be uh, privy to that information. Right. Okay, so uh, at this point, it seems like uh, I wanted to ask Matt Byrne or anyone else from uh, BSC if they would like to um, address the Conservation Commission. Uh, Matt, you already did a little bit, but there might be more to say. So please just introduce sure. yourself for the record. Of course, thanks so much, uh, Matt Byrne. I'm a professional wetland scientist and senior ecologist with BSC Group. Um, I have with me my colleague, Tom Groves, who's a senior botanist with BSC, and he's developed the invasive species management plan for the site. So we're going to um, talk through that. We we thought we'd we thought we'd give a primer on on the approach that that we'd like to take. Um, understanding that this was delivered today, um, and that you would not have had a chance to to look at it, and expecting that Chase would be uh, doing a peer review on that document before kind of getting the seal of approval. Uh, so we just wanted to sort of take a little bit of time to talk 
through that, um, we had um, essentially approached uh, uh, putting together a quick presentation in the same way that we just went through. So um, Chase, I appreciate your, your work. Uh, we received that comment letter uh, this morning um, and we were able to get our landscape architect to make the changes to the to the plan that uh, that were outstanding. So that should be ready. We just want to get it past the client, make sure they don't see anything that we messed up. So that will be on the desk shortly. Um, but Tom, if he can share, uh, has has a handful of slides. Um, and this will be redundant, so I'll just blast through it because um, because we've we've talked about most of it. Um, but I'll start out with just a, a handful of things, run through those comments, and just give any specific response. So Matt, before you get too yeah. much into this, how much time do you do you think you're going to take with this presentation? Ten minutes, Tom. Is that reasonable? Yeah, I I can speed it up. I can I can go through pretty quick. Okay, 10 minutes, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so Tom, if you'd go forward, and like I say, we'll just blast through these first couple. Um, you so to go. Just, just a reminder, this is the site, uh, <laughs> and uh, BLSF is, the, is outlined in blue, the BVW is outlined in green, the yellow, is the BLSF floodplain impact areas. Go ahead. And the restoration planting and uh, compensatory storage areas are outlined in orange. So, so it's the restoration planting areas uh, and, and that, we're, that we're talking about and that we're updating. And one note I'll, I'll make, because I kept getting this confused, our planting list is for the entire site. So there are a handful of plants that are, you know, landscaping plants up amongst the buildings that we're we're trying to push our landscape architects to get away from. Um, so we're we're getting very close to um, straight species from natives. Uh, so we're working hard with them to to get that all sorted out. But that's something to be aware of. Not every plant listed in that table is in buffer zone or jurisdictional area or the restoration. So go ahead. And again, uh, real quick, I, I won't even uh, do anything here. Uh, comment one, resolved. Comment two, uh, is the ISMP, the Invasive Species Management Plan, we have submitted that today and expect that to get, get looked at. Three is resolved. Four is resolved. Five. Um, those are undergoing revision right now and uh, and we'll we'll get you know, we'll demonstrate that we're sort of meeting the, the expectations of the, the peer review comment. Six is resolved, as Chase said. Seven resolved. Eight is resolved. Nine, we've re removed all cultivars. Tom has taken a look at the seed mixes and, and gotten them to all native for uh, the restoration plantings and the um, and the, even the managed lawns, the manicured lawns are all native plants. So that's all been updated. Um, and then uh, comment 10, um, what I think we'd like to do is, is you know, have an administrative approval process and just work with you on site to, to make decisions. The standing stock of snags will change between now and whenever this gets underway. So, so we don't wanna put anything hard and fast we we want to work with the commission and your peer reviewer to, to just make decisions on what's there when the time comes okay go ahead uh so here the only plants we are proposing the only trees we are proposing in the restoration area or the or the compensatory uh, flood storage areas are trees that were specifically identified in SWCA's comment number five. So we've taken out everything that wasn't specifically identified as an acceptable tree species from that planting plan. And then, as I said, the the uh, the seed mixes that we're proposing are all are all verified native at this point. So 
And, and we will present those and, and Chase will have an opportunity to, to look those over and, and verify that. I think that's everything I had. Okay. Um, my name is Tom Groves. I'm the senior botanist with BSC. Um, I'll just give you a quick background on what I've done in terms of ecological restoration over the past 10 years. Um, I've been with BSC for one year, um, but prior to that, I worked for a forestry company managing an invasive control unit for um, eight years across New England. So I had licenses in Vermont, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Um, and uh, I've worked for USDA, Fish and Wildlife, NRCS, um, private landowners, Department of Defense, uh, National Wildlife Refugees, state departments, and municipalities. Um, so I took a walk with Matt out on the site in February. Um, and it, this is a picture of the site here. Um, but there's 12 invasive species in total that I could identify at that time of year. And when you look at a site, you want to um, take into account those species because that's gonna be really important in terms of how you plan your invasive species management plan. Um, and there's four different types of control you can think of, cultural, biological, mechanical, and chemical. Um, cultural, I noticed you all have that paint your invasive plants pink um, sort of like thing in, in Arlington, which was really cool to see because that's a cultural control you're teaching um, your citizens about invasive plants and the importance of getting rid of them, which is great. Um, biological control is a little hard to implement most of the time because you're introducing, you know, a lot of the times you're introducing a non-native insect or additional pest to control a non-native plant. Um, so that has a lot of stickiness to it. Um, they can get out of control. And so for the purposes of this management plan, we're going to be talking about mechanical and chemical control. And in one case, we're going to be talking about them together. Um, so an overview of mechanical control, this can encompass anything from mulching, hand pulling, smothering, um, to brush saws and chainsaws to manage vegetation. And one thing to remember is it's always site specific. So access is really important, what those conditions are like. Um, you know, if it's wet, if it's dry, there's a whole bunch of things that come into play with that. Some of the pros with a mechanical control treatment is you improve your access. So this site in particular has a lot of vegetation around, woody vegetation that makes access a little difficult. Um, so that could be an improvement in that situation for future control efforts. Um, there's no herbicide used. And the best way to do mechanical control is during um, when your populations are really small and the plants are young. So you can pull them out of the ground and it's really easy to do that. So it's a really effective way you can get 100% control in, with that method. The cons of this mechanical control treatment most of the time are you increase disturbance, which means more invasive plants will germinate in the soil. Access is very dependent. Um, you need to revisit that site over and over throughout the growing season to continue to cut those plants down. Um, it's not a long-term strategy for treatment on its own most of the time. It, tends to be very expensive. It's non-discriminant. So any native plants that are there right now are gonna get mulched or treated the same way as the invasives, which isn't a great thing if you're trying to outcompete invasive plants with native plants, which is another prong of that um, integrated pest management control method that we all use. Um, and when you cut plants, it changes the hormone. So you have the potential, if you don't come back and treat those again, you have the potential for more stems, more flowers, which means more seeds, which in the end means more invasive plants. Um, so uh, the additional thing in this case in particular would be that it would make supplemental plantings difficult to avoid. So if we put plantings in there and then expected to do mechanical control over a long period of time, it would be very difficult to do that. Chemical control tends to be inexpensive, uh, it's low impact, low disturbance, so there's no soil turn turnover. Uh, you preserve your native plant populations because your invasive control with chemicals is very targeted. Um, you generally do one treatment a year. It's 90 to 95% effective in that first year. And subsequent years after that is also, you can get it up to a, a high percentage rate like that. Um, it can be done in really difficult to access locations because it's just done with a person. Um, and healthy plants are easier to kill than damaged plants that would happen after mechanical control. The cons are you have to have a license. Uh, a, a really good knowledge of invasive native plant biology, 
um, and there's a generally a negative public opinion about this. Some of the methods for chemical control are foliar, the fun, fun named one bloody glove, backpacks, hydro sprayer, cut stump, basal bark, and stem injection. Um, so we generally think about herbicides. Uh, Roundup is the most common one that you buy off the shelf at tractor supply. Those are pre-mixed with surfactants that aren't made for wetlands. So in my ISMP, I, I recommended using a wetland approved herbicide um, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, because it's mixed with a non-ionic surfactant, which means it's water soluble, so it doesn't affect amphibians that may be living on the site. Um, and our bad ideas about Roundup usually come from industrial farming, where it's applied over and over repeatedly throughout a season. There's poor soil quality there, and eventually it runs off into your waterways. Um, the wetland-approved glyphosate product is mixed with a non-ionic surfactant. Uh, there's no soil activity, so native seeds continue to be able to germinate in future seasons. Um, the application method is really specific to those plants based on surface area, which I'll talk about in a minute. The LD50 is very high, which is good because you want a, a higher LD50, um, which means it's less toxic. And so there's a little uh, inset there showing the LD50 of glyphosate versus table salt um, and nicotine, for example. Uh, glyphosate has a 40-day half-life, which is very short in terms of herbicides. It quickly binds to soil. There's no percolation um, into the water table. It's broken down readily by sunlight, bacteria, and fungi. And the pathway that plants have, humans don't have. So plants create their own amino acids. We get our amino acids from eating plants or animals that have eaten plants. Um, this is just, this is public information. You can go onto your Massachusetts website and get this. This is actually from Vermont. This just shows categories of licenses and the number of different herbicides, pesticides, fungicides that are sprayed per category. So you can notice um, forestry has seven there. Golf courses have a, an insane list. Um, and then lawn care and ornamentals also have a large list there. And this is just in terms of total pounds of active ingredient, forestry, very low, which is the license that would be needed for a, a restoration project like this. Golf courses is, is up into the 45,000 pounds of active ingredient and lawn care is somewhere down in like the thousand range. Um, and the number of pesticides you can see here goes up with these, uh, similar to that table I showed you. Chemical application methods, I break them down into three groups, high volume, moderate volume, low volume, um, and the applicable methods that they're applied with are described there. Um, so your maximum herbicide is 100% concentration. That would be not cutting your solution at all. And that is in stem injection, which is used for knotweed a lot of the time. But you go over your allowable rate per acre very quickly that way. So a hydro sprayer or mist blowers, which is categorized as a high volume treatment, uh, you hit much more of the surface area of the plant. And so you can use a much lower rate of herbicide at a 1% or 2%. Um, and so this is like the ounces per gallon based on application method. And you can see that this ounce per gallon for one or 2% is 2.56 ounces to 128 ounces of water. Um, and as you go up into your, and you reduce your surface area, you have to have more, a higher percentage of herbicide to kill the plant. This is a, basically the cut stump method in a nutshell. There's no overspray. Um, you're just treating the living part of the cambium on the outside of the tree. So this is all dead wood on the inside and it's applied with a buckthorn blaster, which is very contained, uh, so low impact. And this graph here just shows the relationship between surface area. So when you do a high volume application, you treat both sides of the leaves or the photosynthetic stems. Um, with a regular backpack application, you're only hitting the top side of the the leaves. And then with a stump treatment, you're only treating the small part of the cambium. So it's very little surface area. So you have to have um, more herbicide inside that buckthorn blaster to actually kill that plant. And your acres that you're able to cover over time are reduced because this is so time intensive to cut all your stems and treat them that way. Uh, so just quickly, some past results. This all used to be knotweed in here. And um, it was treated with a high volume application uh, a number of years ago. The, the landowner sold the house, but it was mulched a couple seasons after I had treated it. And then they reseeded it with grass and there's no knotweed in here at the moment. So that's, that's a success story. The next one is this riparian area. 
used to have knotweed all along in here. And this was treated about six years ago. And there's a few stems coming back, but this was also done with uh, a low volume backpack sprayer. But long term control um, of 90% or better in this riparian um, wet zone. And the last one is field edges uh, along a farm. Um, one of my clients, one of my previous clients, uh, this all used to be glossy buckthorn. We treated this with a high volume, high volume foliar application. And what you have coming back is swamp aster and um, jewelweed, all native plants. There's, there's one buckthorn here coming back. You can still see it. So they're much smaller um, and easy to treat. And the follow-up includes much less chemical. The hybrid approach that I just want to touch on real quick is that um, for this site in particular, because of the Japanese knotweed, if mechanical control was something that was, you know, we wanted to look at, um, the Japanese knotweed would need to be treated first because a mechanical control on your knotweed is going to spread it further because they do not spread via seed, they spread via cuttings and rhizomes. Um, so if we were to go in there and do a mechanical treatment without actually treating the Japanese knotweed first, we could potentially be making it worse. Um, and, and Mechanical control is going to cause a lot of seed flushing because of the mulching that's going to happen. And this can be a positive as long as there's a chemical controlled treatment planned afterwards. Um, if there isn't the invasive population in that area, the number of invasive plants in there is going to exponentially increase. Um, and so chemical control post mechanical treatment can actually reduce the amount of herbicide you use because all of your plants, all your woody plants that come back that you're going to do a foliar treatment on are going to be the same height. Um, and you can do it in less time and use less herbicide to get it get it treated. The timing of these this schedule, which I'll show you next is very important. Um, so if you change anything in the timetable, you have to Tom, sort of shift everything. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. I don't yeah. know how many slides you have left, but I'm assuming we're going to review this and you're going to give some part of this presentation at our next meeting also. Okay. It seems like you're being really thorough right now. So yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm in interest of time and I want to get to anybody that's, that's been here. So I, I don't want to get um, too involved in this. If you're going to give the same presentation at the next meeting. So um, there's like three slides left. Okay. Uh, and the two of them are these tables, which are in the ISMP, but it would be helpful for me just to describe how I set them up because they could be seen as complicated if you don't take a look at it first. So these, these yellow blocks are your, um, treatment months. Now, if you, this is the chemical control method, um, down here, you'll see it changes to orange where this is considered season two of the treatment. Now that can be done at the end here. So yellow is still your season one if it was done during November and December. If you don't do that, you have to wait until this time of year to do it. Um, and the same for the mechanical control option. There's also another timetable here. Um, and I've included you know, multiple years of monitoring, follow-up treatments. Um, and some options for like creating wildlife piles and smothering with wood chips from these trees that would be cutting down on site, like the Noru maples and the um, tree of heaven. Yeah, so um, again, I'm going to say in the interest of time, the commission hasn't reviewed this. I'm going to ask the commission to hold off on their questions and allow me to go straight to comments and questions from anyone attending tonight's hearing. Can you take down the screen? Thank you. Uh, is anyone here that uh, attended tonight's meeting have a question? Uh, and it would have to be specifically about um, a third party view on habitat, uh, habitat evaluation in the third party review report and the reports that you've heard here tonight. Just go to the uh, reactions button and use the rain, raise hand function. Oh, seeing none. And I am going to turn back to the commission. We got through that uh, report. We have a few minutes. It's, it's 10 minutes past, uh, seven minutes past 10. And if there's any questions, this can come up now, or again, because we've had a couple of things that we need to review, 
management, uh, the invasive management, and there's a new plan coming in from BSC. We'll be talking about this habitat valuation at our next meeting also. Susan Chapnick has her hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Just very briefly. I really appreciate, Tom, your your review. Um, I will just point out um, that this commission is very adverse to using herbicides. And when we do approve them, we tend to approve the very onerous methods of um, bloody glove and stump and things like that. And we're, we're very uh, hesitant to approve foliar applications, at least we haven't near um, our larger aquatic resources like Spy Pond and the reservoir. Um, that said, we've looked also looked for um, substitutes for glyphosate. I know you had several listed there. So I just want to throw that out because we're not going to discuss this now. We didn't get to read your whole plan yet, mm -hmm. but these are considerations. So for next time for continuation that we'll probably have more in-depth questions or concerns about. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or motions from the Conservation Commission? And um, if we're going to do a motion, I'd like to hear from the applicant that they're giving us permission to continue this to the next meeting. That would be, I, I would make a motion, but would like to get the applicant's consent. We anticipated that you would need to continue to review all that material. Thank so, you. Yes. I'll make a motion to continue this hearing to our March 21st meeting. And a second? Second. Okay. Um, Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Oh, sorry, David White's not uh, recused himself. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Chuck Taroni says yes. Oh, <laughs> Brian McBride. Oh no, Brian, are you there? I don't think he's on any longer. I'm assuming the participant list. Okay. We have enough for a quorum. Um, this has been continued to uh, March 21st, and I uh, appreciate that. And do you know our submittal deadline for supplemental material? Uh, we have for the distribution for the Conservation Commission mm -hmm. would be in effect for this next uh, packet with the plans and the updated management plan. It's the 13th. The 13th. Yeah. At noon. Yeah. 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 Okay. And with that, um, from the commission, can I, uh, I, we're done with our agenda just to uh, go over that again. And could I get a motion to, uh, Adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Susan Chapnick. Yes. I don't think David White joined back in. So uh, David Kaplan. Okay. Um, just just real quick, I had to step out for a second. Did we already vote to continue 88 um, Coolidge? Yeah, we did yes, that. We did. Before. All right. Sorry, That's I missed that. But yes. Not a big deal. I should have Okay. Vote to adjourn. So David Kaplan, yes. Uh, Mike Gilda's game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone that attended tonight. Thank you for the commission. And, Thanks very uh, much. We'll, we'll see you all. Appreciate you later. hanging in there. <laughs> yep. right. Good, night. Good night. Good night, everyone.